I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. And as the members and friends who I see here in the audience know, we begin all of our programs here by reciting our inspiring congressional mantra, our mission statement, so that we can prepare ourselves for the learning ahead. And for those of you who are here for the first time, I'm asking all of our friends to recite it for you now. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful, very well done. It is a great honor to welcome uh, the judges uh, who've been convened by the Federal Judicial Center for the, these two days of learning about the history and meaning of the Fourth Amendment. Our collaboration with the Federal Judicial Center goes back uh, many years. For the past uh, several years, we've hosted every year a convening about different topics involving the Constitution, from the history of the Reconstruction Amendments to the legacy of John Marshall, and today, it's a thrill to convene America's leading scholars and commentators to talk about the history and current meaning of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I have a special pleasure in moderating this first session with two great scholars whose work I've long admired. I will introduce them now and we'll jump right in. Uh, Christopher Slobogan is Milton R. Underwood, Chair in Law, Director for Criminal Justice Program, and an affiliate professor of psychiatry at Vanderbilt Law School. He's one of the five most cited criminal law and procedure law professors in the country over the past five years. His books include Privacy at Risk, The New Government Surveillance, and The Fourth Amendment. And Laura K. Donahue is Professor of Law at Georgetown, Director of Georgetown Center for National Security Law, and Director of the Center of Privacy and Technology. Her most recent book, The Future of Foreign Intelligence, Privacy and Surveillance in a Digital Age. Uh, Chris and Laura uh, are both uh, America's leading experts on the history of warrants and the history of subpoenas. And those are obviously two crucially important topics, much mooted in the country today. Each of them, in turn, will give us a, a, a brief encapsulation of their learning about the history of warrants and subpoenas. I'll ask them a few questions, and then we'll, uh, they'll have a conversation between the two of them. So Laura, I think we will begin with you. And please tell us about the history of warrants. OK, uh, can we get the slides up? Thanks very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I'd like to be a little bit provocative, actually, today. We're going to talk about the history of the Fourth Amendment, but my basic suggestion for our conversation is that the way the doctrine has evolved is utterly ill-suited for a digital world and for the digital world in which we find ourselves. And there are various reasons. Oops. Uh, we seem to have started in the middle of the slideshow. Kind of like the... Lower courts. <laughs> <laughs> that we start in the middle. OK, I'll just back it up like this very quickly. Uh, all right, well, we'll just start here. Um, so, my, so my suggestion is that, in fact, what we're seeing in terms of Fourth Amendment doctrine is that the way we have traditionally protected the rights that we protected at the founding, uh, that is specifically through public versus private space, through private versus third party information, through the distinction between content and non-content, and domestic versus international, that all of these are breaking down. And they're breaking down in four ways. The, the lines between these categories in Fourth Amendment doctrine Doctrine are becoming blurred. Information that we would have protected, even at the founding, is no longer protected. Categories that we have now don't capture really important privacy interests that all of us have as citizens. And there is no use restriction. So if this information is collected at the outset, there is no Fourth Amendment doctrinal restriction on how that is then used, that information. In my view, this is one of the most serious risks that we're facing going forward for rights in the United States. So let me just talk for a moment before turning it back over about what the meaning was of the Fourth Amendment at the founding. So yeah, it's hard starting in the middle. Yeah. 
Okay. We'll, we'll just jump in. I don't think the slides Wonderful. are working. Yeah, we'll just move forward with it. Sorry. So first I want to talk about a general warrant. What is a general warrant? Well, a general warrant is basically a document that's issued by the court or the executive, which gives officials the authority to search for and to seize private documents without any prior evidence of wrongdoing. There's no oath. There's no particularization in terms of the person or place to be searched or the things or property to be seized. Uh, it's basically used as a way to get information that can then be used to prosecute somebody. Now, for centuries prior to the American founding, in England, this was roundly rejected. So if you look at Cook's writing during the, during the reign of Charles I, the famous English jurist, Edward Cook, he argued in Parliament against using these, even when threats to the realm, what we identify as national security now, were of issue. If such instruments be used, he said, per mandatum domine regis, or for matters of state, then we are gone, we're in a worse case than ever. If we agree for matters of state, then we shall leave Magna Carta and do what our ancestors would never do. Cook returned to these arguments in his institutes. Uh, he wrote that general warrants were against Magna Carta. Charles I, in this twist of fate, actually seized Cook's institutes using a general warrant. Huh. Um, nevertheless, it became cemented into English law. So Matthew Hale, he's an intellectual giant, most famous really for his history of the common law of England. He noted in Historian Practicum uh, Coronae, or the history of the pleas of the crown, that a general warrant to search in all places is not good, but only to search in particular places. And as we move through English history, all of the major cases that come down, like nor uh, regarding North Britain number 45, uh, they actually cite back to Cook and Hale to basically say that general warrants were an anathema to the British Constitution. So when the colonists left England and came to the United States, they really expected that these, this right, this protection against general warrants, would travel with them. Uh, William Pitt, uh, the elder, aka Lord Chatham, kind of a darling of the American Revolution, as he explained in Parliament, every man's house is called his castle. Why? because it's surrounded by a moat or defended by a wall? No, the poorest man may in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. Its roof may be frail, it may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the king of England may not enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. So there was this idea that the, a man's house was his home, and while he was in his home, he was as well guarded as a prince uh, in his castle. But in America, Britain started using general warrants, and particularly writs of assistance, to try to get individuals served with a writ of assistance to help them to find evidence of criminal wrongdoing. And one of the most famous cases in American history then becomes Otis's uh, case, when uh, Otis stands up and rails against the use of these warrants. It's known as Paxton's case. In this case, Otis said, I will to my dying day oppose with all the powers and faculties God has given me, all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other as a general warrant is. So John Adams, who was present at Paxton's uh, case, at uh, Otis's oration, later said that was the first shot of the revolution. Then and there, the child liberty was born. So when it came time to write the new constitution uh, in 1787, one of the greatest objections to it was that it did not include a prohibition on general warrants, that even as the Articles of Confederation had fallen from use and we had strengthened the new federal government, there was no restriction on the federal government in terms of national government in terms of general warrants. This was the really the focus of some of Patrick Henry's discourse, his kind of amazing diatribe against the Constitution if you go back to the ratification debates in Virginia. Uh, and so <laughs> here in Pennsylvania, in Virginia, in a number of states at the founding, the states had adopted a prohibition on general warrants, and they did so in language that's eerily close to what we now have in the Constitution. So when Madison was entrusted with writing the Bill of Rights, he promised to outlaw general warrants. And the language of the Fourth Amendment thus reads, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure. And by unreasonable, it meant against the reason of the common law. I didn't mean this relativistic post-cats kind of uh, putting the court in the middle of social determinations of what's reasonable or not reasonable. It meant against the reason of the common law, which meant a prohibition of general warrants and a requirement that 
warrants be so particular as to name the person or place to be searched and the thing or property or persons to be seized. And so the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution, in light of this history, really is most properly understood and read as a prohibition on general warrants on the one hand, and at the same time, a list of the particulars that have to be satisfied for a specific warrant to actually be valid. So that's, that's the basic underpinning for the Fourth Amendment. Now what's happened in terms of the doctrine, and I'll just conclude with, with a quick uh, statement about how this has evolved, is that in, as you know, the, the types of interests that the founders were worried about, the things that they really wanted to make sure were protected were things like liberty. Right? They wanted to make sure that there, was, there were no constraints, that the, the insight of the Panopticon, Jeremy Bentham in 1787, the same year we're drafting the Constitution, he's writing about the ultimate prison, which is where every individual is under observation constantly. And it's not that somebody's going to do something to them, it's the idea that you self-regulate when others are watching you, when others see what you're doing, what you say and what you do changes. And the founders were writing in that era where they were aware that the liberty constraint is actually a very important one and not actually self-constraining yourself in what you think and what you write. They wrote about the humanistic value of this, the importance in the context of general warrants, that it was important to be able to come into ourselves and our own as human beings in terms of our spiritual and intellectual and personal relationships. Uh, as a social matter, to be able to mediate our social boundaries outside the gaze of the government. They were concerned that giving the government access to your friends could put you in a compromise position, and they wrote extensively about how giving the government the power to use a general warrant would allow the government to collect information against you and to target political opponents and to be able to build cases and make it look as though you were guilty. And so in order to head this off, we have this prohibition on general warrants. Now over time, there have been ways in which we have tried to make these interests, um, give, them, give them protections within the constitutional doctrine of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, pretty much since Katz, and we can talk about this later, I think we've increasingly failed to do so, particularly in light of digitization. I'll leave it there. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, extremely uh, inspiring and uh, uh, insightful presentation. So a, a few questions. Um, you quoted uh, Otis's denunciation of the rich of assistance, which Chief Justice Roberts quoted in the Riley case uh, very beautifully, and, and along with Adams' statement that at that moment the child revolution was born. And Otis said that the goal was to avoid both slavery and villainy. What was the difference between the two? So, sorry, say that again? O Otis said that uh, general warrants would allow the king's agents to engage in either slavery or villainy. Slavery What's on the, the one difference? hand and yeah. villainy on the other, yes. So the idea of, uh, of slavery is you could manipulate and control people if you know enough information about them. You could uh, hold them hostage to that. You could, in fact, threaten to reveal certain sensitive information if they don't act in a manner consistent with what you would like to see from them. So if you don't toe the line, if you don't support them on certain measures, if you don't, um, organize a, a meeting at their behest, that this was a way of, of actually controlling individuals. Villainy, on the other, was a way of actually getting, it's, it's pretty much what happened during the McCarthy era, right? So during COINTELPRO, getting into people's lives, going to their employers, um, getting them fired for ostensibly being communists at the time, uh, putting false information out there, putting, uh, going to the newspapers and putting up information that wasn't true, moving, inf moving money between bank accounts to make it look like individuals are engaged in nefarious activities. If you don't have access to all of this, you can't actually work in, this, in these instrumentalities in a way to cause really in a very underhanded, unprincipled, concerning way, interference in the private lives of individuals in a way that has repercussions for their social status, for their political uh, actions, for their ability to engage socially. Absolutely fascinating. And that really helps encapsulate both how a fear of the crown retaliating against its critics was the core of the amendment, but also a fear about other forms of social control. So if the paradigmatic examples of the Fourth Amendment violators are John Wilkes, author of North Britain 45, and the colonists who are the victims of the general warrants, um, what 
were the central doctrinal changes that undermine the principle you identified, namely the executive cannot intrude on an individual unless specified criteria are met. So the home historically stood as a proxy for this. And so one of the first questions to present the United States was what about papers when they leave the home? So if the home is a proxy for protecting the social, intellectual, humanistic in liberty interests of individuals, then what happens when your papers then leave? And in ex parte Jackson, the court said, no, your papers, when they're being carried through the post, are as protected as if they're sitting in your desk, in a locked desk inside your, inside your den. Your familial relationships, your intimate uh, relations with with whoever it might be, a business about uh, your, your, your commercial papers that was actually included at the founding. So business records were also private. They were not for the government to know what all of your business records were. So in Ex Party Jackson, which dealt with a lottery, uh, there was a, a, a question as to whether something in a closed envelope being sent through the post was protected, and the court said, yes, it is. Olmstead was kind of the next major shift, which is, well, what if your voice leaves your home? Because now with wire communications, something that you might say privately to somebody else in your home might leave the home. And initially, the court said, well, no, it's actually physically leaving the home. But then eventually, the court reversed this, right? And they said in Katz, no, when that voice leaves the home, if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy and it's one society is willing to recognize as reasonable, then you have an expectation of privacy there with cats. Now, the mere evidence rule, I think, is, is very probative here. So until 1967, uh, in fact, uh, in a case called Warren versus Hayden, this was just before, so a few months, four months before cats came down, in this case called Warden versus Hayden, prior to that, Everything you did was protected, so you couldn't get a warrant to obtain your letters. There, there couldn't be. It was only the fruits and instrumentalities of crime. That's how private papers were. That's how private and how important the founders felt the types of things that you entrust to your friends, to your social contacts, uh, to your acquaintances, to your colleagues, to your business partners, that that was so private, you couldn't even use a warrant to get that information unless it was evidence of the crime itself, or the, the fruit, the, sorry, the, the fruit of the crime, so like the, the picture that you stole, or the instrumentality, the smoking gun that you used, right, to kill somebody. Outside of that, you could not just cast about and see what was going on in people's lives, even when there was a crime. You couldn't obtain that for evidence. In Warden versus Hayden, this fell away. And even as they said, as they changed that doctrine, they said that they were concerned that the government would then feel entitled to go into your homes to find out more about your private lives. You know, we're now 50 years on from that, and we are so far down that road. It's, it's really quite extraordinary in light of the original understanding of the types of interests that the Fourth Amendment was meant to protect. Warden versus Hayden is such a crucial case, striking, written by William Brennan, not thought of as a pro-government uh, judge, but that, as you say, centrally undermined the founding era protection for private papers. Uh, tell us, finally, what about the uh, third uh, party doctrine? And the uh, you noted also that there are no use restrictions on data, unlike in Germany, for example, where data seized for one purpose cannot be used for another. Uh, to what degree did the 30 the third party doctrine undermine the use restrictions that were taken for granted at the time of the founding. Yeah, so third party doctrine, so I, in full disclosure, I just wrote an article for the Supreme Court Review um, really decrying uh, both cats and third party doctrine as many on all sides of the ideological spectrum really yes. see this as just a, a complete and utter um, usurpation of the protections that otherwise would be afforded to individuals. And this really came out of two cases, Miller and Smith. Um, Smith was this case where Patricia, um, Patricia McDonough was walking up in Baltimore, and uh, somebody mugged her and took her purse. And when she was being mugged, she saw this 1975 Monte Carlo car right sitting there. And she went back home. And somebody called her on the phone and made threatening remarks to her and told her to go out on her porch. And that same car, the Monte Carlo, drove slowly by her home. So the, uh, she called the police. The police were in the neighborhood. They saw the car. They ran the plates. It belonged to a guy named Michael Lee Smith. And so they went to the phone company and they said, look, we have this really cool device, a pen register trap and trace. Uh, you know, back then, telephone calls were recorded by the, um, by the number of minutes, you know, domestic or international. So they didn't have the capability to record the numbers that you call and the numbers that call you. But the phone company said, you know, that's OK. You can put that on the line. And so they did. And sure enough, he called Patricia McDonough. 
The police use that to, as a, to get a warrant to go into his home, and there they find her purse, the telephone book turned down to her name, um, and the man that actually has, has mugged her. So when it came to trial, the court said, uh, the, um, sorry, Michael E. Smith said, oh no, this is a violation of my privacy because the numbers I call are very private. They can tell a lot about a person. And the court said, no, it's not private. And they, they borrowed from informant doctrine, which in Katz, Justice White was at pains to point out that the informant doctrine had been untouched. And that doctrine, which had developed really in a mafia context, was that if you tell somebody something, you don't have an expectation of privacy that that information will, in fact, be kept private. And so for a telephone, the, you know, the old way was somebody would sit at a switchboard and move the, move the wire cherry seven calling you know, Roger six, and you would move the wire over. So you were telling that person who you were calling, so you didn't have a privacy interest. Now fast forward, and the problem is that you know, in an age of Get Smart and Star Trek, where this stuff is like fantastic as though it doesn't exist, and talking through a shoe phone, portable shoe phone, is, <laughs> is laughable. You know, now we're in an age where all of us have cell phones, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, those phones actually record a lot of information about us. They record not just who we call and who calls us, but where we go, what we do, and whom we're with when we do so. And that's a very different world. So on the one hand, Claire Egan, uh, Judge Egan writing for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, because this is an area where we see this come up a lot, she says, look, zero plus zero is still zero. So if under Smith versus Maryland, third party doctrine, when you give records to a third party, you have no privacy interest. The fact that the uh, <laughs> National Security Agency collected almost all Americans' telephony metadata for almost 10 years uh, in order to try to find evidence of illegal activity with no prior suspicion of illegal activity, no oath or affirmation, no particularity, no probable cause demonstrated, something that looks a lot like a general warrant, well, under third party doctrine, it's completely allowed. So third party doctrine, I think, has been foremost, which is why Jones, Riley, and then most recently Carpenter, I think, have been so important. Um, third party doctrine, more than anything else, I think, has really undermined a lot of the Fourth Amendment protections, that in, in conjunction with technology. Thank you for stressing the centrality of the third party doctrine. It is important that it was not applied uh, most recently in Carpenter. I had a remarkable experience right before Carpenter came down. I gave a speech essentially saying, as you did, that the application of the third party doctrine in Carpenter would be like a general uh, warrant and Smith shouldn't apply. And this was at the Chautauqua Institute. A guy got up in the front row and said, I argued Smith. And I agree, it should not be applied in this case. That's not what we had in mind at all. And in fact, the court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, refused to apply it, seeming to understand the importance of preserving the original principle that private papers cannot be lightly seized without particularity. That was great. Thank you so much for that. And now, Chris Logan, I'm so eager to hear you on the history of subpoenas back in the mists of the 1990s, I had mm -hmm. wondered uh, during the Clinton impeachment how it was that it was possible to issue a subpoena for private diaries, uh, since the protection of private diaries in the age of John Wilkes was the quintessential example of an unreasonable and unconstitutional search. And I had the chance to ask uh, Judge Starr, Ken Starr that, in the middle of the investigation. How, how, how is that consistent with the original understanding? And he said, we decided to our enterprises it. And our enterprise, of course, mm -hmm. is the case that says as long as the papers are reasonably related to a legitimate criminal investigation, they may be seized. Tell us how that principle, which seems to be the antithesis of the original understanding, which held that you can't seize private diaries by subpoena, uh, came about. What was the evolution that made that remarkable dilution of the Fourth Amendment? Yeah, I'd be glad to answer that question. Um, I do have PowerPoints, but given Laura's experience and uh, the fact that I want to protect my neck, I'm just going to sit here and tell you what the PowerPoint slides uh, revealed. And I think the discussion of uh, personal papers segues very nicely into what I want to talk about. I am going to talk about the history of subpoenas. Um, as you know, hundreds of thousands of subpoenas are issued every day by judges, administrative agencies, uh, prosecutors, and even individual agents. And we even have hybrid subpoenas uh, that allow personal papers to be obtained on less than relevance. But the central point about subpoenas, as Jeff just emphasized, is subpoenas can be issued on a showing of mere relevance. They don't require a showing of probable cause. And yet subpoenas allow 
law enforcement to get access to financial records, to communication records, to medical records, and a whole host of other sources of information. Now, how did that come about? How is it the case the government can get a hold of all this kind of personal information on a mere showing of relevance, on a showing that does not come anywhere near probable cause, which we associate with warrants? Well, I think to answer that question, you have to understand the history of target subpoenas. Those are subpoenas that are executed against the target of an investigation. Now, today it's true, most subpoenas are third-party subpoenas, but I think in order to understand where we got where we are today, how we got to where we are today, we have to understand the history of target subpoenas. Uh, the first subpoenas that we know about occurred uh, in the late 17th century in the reign of Charles II, but those subpoenas were issued in civil cases. It was very clear that in criminal cases, a subpoena could not issue to command documents from a target, from an individual. And so, for instance, you have cases from the King's Bench which said this, that a court may not, quote, make a man produce evidence against himself in a criminal prosecution. That's what Laura was alluding to a little bit earlier. That's a very strong statement. It's obviously language that presages the Fifth Amendment. And that's one of the important points I want to make, that the history of subpoenas is more history of the Fifth Amendment, not history of the Fourth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment has just as much of a role to play here as the Fourth Amendment. So that's what the King's Bench said. And in fact, by the time the Fifth Amendment was drafted, it was clear that under the common law, there was an absolute prohibition on compelling the production of documents from an individual. Now, in this country, there were some scattered cases in the 19th century that suggested otherwise. But then in 1886, we get the decision of Boyd versus the United States, which all of you know about. And in that decision, the Supreme Court held that the subpoena issued in that case violated both the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment, because the subpoena required Boyd to testify against himself, um, in the guise of documents, and the Fourth Amendment because that compulsion of papers uh, was an unreasonable seizure of his private documents. Now, interestingly, um, this is a very strong statement of the protection of papers because Boyd actually was not subject to criminal sanctions. He was only subject to civil sanctions, which at least technically means that he did not have the protection of the Fifth Amendment, and yet the Supreme Court said the Fifth Amendment applied here. And in terms of privacy, the document demanded by the subpoena in Boyd was a mere business invoice, which is hardly the most private kind of document one can imagine. And yet the court said that this subpoena was unconstitutional on both Fifth and Fourth Amendment grounds, a very strong statement by the court. But within 20 years, the court had begun the decimation of Boyd. And the most important case here is Hale versus Henkel, decided in 1906, which involved a subpoena of a corporation. And the Supreme Court said, the subpoena was valid despite Fifth and Fourth Amendment claims made by the corporation. Fifth Amendment didn't apply because corporations are not the person referred to in the Fourth Amendment. They're not the type of person referred to in the Fifth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment did not impose any restrictions unless the subpoena was so sweeping that it would basically put the corporation out of business because it had to surrender all of its papers to the government. Of course, in this digital age, that's not a problem. So in other words, no Fifth Amendment protection for corporations and virtually no Fourth Amendment protection. As the court summed it up in the 1946 case of Oklahoma Press versus Walling, um, with respect to corporations, the Fifth Amendment affords no protection by virtue of the self-incrimination provision, whether for the corporation or for its officers, and the Fourth Amendment, if applicable, at the most guards against abuse only by way of too much indefiniteness or breadth. And four years later, we get my favorite quote from the Supreme Court in this area. It says, a subpoena is valid, quote, even if one were to regard the request for information as caused by nothing more than official curiosity. Now, I don't know what the definition of official curiosity is, but I think if you had to define it, it's probably even lower than relevance. And yet that was a statement by the court in Morton Salt. Um, but what has seldom been noted about these cases that I just described is they all had to do with corporations, not with subpoenas aimed at individuals, and aimed at individuals to get their personal papers. And the court thought this distinction was very important. So for instance, in Hale, the court said, quote, there is a clear distinction between an individual and a corporation. Um, in cases involving document demands, because a corporation is a creature of the state, while the individual, quote, owes no such duty to the state, since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. In Oklahoma Press, the other case, uh, one of the other cases I mentioned, the court repeated that this decision applied, quote, merely to the production of corporate records and papers. And in Morton Salt, the court said, quote, corporations can claim no equality with individuals in the enjoyment of a right to privacy. And notice that use of the language right to privacy. In essence, what the court was saying here in these cases is corporations have no Fifth Amendment right. 
But with respect to individual papers, the Fifth Amendment creates a zone of privacy that protects those papers. And that, in fact, was the phrase, zone of privacy, the court later used in Griswold versus Connecticut. And that idea continued through to the 1970s. So we get the, the Dionysio case in 1973, where the court said that a grand jury, quote, cannot require the production by a person of private books and records that would incriminate him. Now, again, that's a pretty stunning statement as recently as 1973. On the other hand, there were rumblings against this idea that the Fifth Amendment protected private papers. So in 1964, nine years before Dionysio, the very, the little known case, Ryan versus the United States, upheld a subpoena for an individual's tax records and didn't even mention the Fifth Amendment or the Fourth Amendment. And then in Couch, um, Couch versus the United States, um, this decided the same year as Dionysio, uh, the court said, a person cannot reasonably claim either for Fourth or Fifth Amendment purposes an expectation of privacy and tax records. Now, it would have been possible to distinguish Ryan and Couch from Dionysio by saying, well, both Ryan and Couch involve tax records, which you could say are regulatory records of the type that were described in the corporate decisions that I was talking about earlier. But as all of you know, in just a few years after Couch in Fisher versus the United States, the Supreme Court did away with virtually all Fifth Amendment protection for all types of documents, because what Fisher said is the Fifth Amendment has nothing to say about intrusions into privacy, it has nothing to say about the zone of privacy, and is only about preventing coercion. So that means that unless the act of production that's compelled by subpoena is both incriminating and testimonial, there's no Fifth Amendment protection of documents because the content of documents are voluntarily created. So note what the impact of Fisher is. Fisher says that individual, individually possessed documents are entitled to no more protection than corporate records. And corporate records had received virtually no protection since Hale versus Henkel. Now, the court did recognize this, that it was uh, surrendering a lot of protection of individual records. And so in 2000, United States versus Hubble, uh, it did state that if the subpoena requires the individual to, quote, take the mental and physical steps necessary to provide uh, uh, the prosecutor with an accurate inventory of the many sources of potentially incriminating evidence sought by a subpoena, the Fifth Amendment would be violated. So what Hubble said, is that the prosecutor does have to provide some particularity with respect to what the subpoena is trying to obtain. But it's very unclear what Hubble means. In fact, a lot of target subpoenas are still being issued based on showings of mere relevance. So Hubble doesn't put much of a dent in Fisher's holding, though it is out there uh, for defense attorneys to argue. Now, of course, one, you might well be thinking, what does this have to do with the typical subpoena today? Because the typical subpoena today is not a target subpoena, it's a third party subpoena, right? And the Fifth Amendment has no role to play, never has had any role to play with respect to third party subpoenas. Because a third party subpoena doesn't require the third party to self incriminate, right? It only requires the third party to produce documents that might incriminate someone else. So the Fifth Amendment provides no protection in the third party subpoena situation. And this wasn't a big deal a century ago or two centuries ago because most personal information was not maintained by third parties. But of course, we're in an entirely different situation today, as Laura was talking about. But all of our personal information is, is in the possession of third parties. And yet, not only does the Fifth Amendment not provide any protection, neither does the Fourth Amendment provide very much protection in this situation. And it's not just because of Miller and Smith, the third party doctrine, which engages in this very weird reasoning that you assume the risk that if you surrender information to a third party for one purpose, it, will be, it can be given to the government for another purpose. Put Miller and Smith aside, it's also because in Hale versus Henkel, over a century ago, the court stated that official curiosity was the only thing required in order to get a subpoena for documents. And the point I want to emphasize is this, that Hale arrived at that conclusion, imposing very few restrictions on subpoenas, because it thought it only applied to subpoenas for corporations. It thought individual papers would be protected by the Fifth Amendment and the zone of privacy. But of course, 120 years later, the Fifth Amendment is entirely gone. And so now official curiosity justifies subpoenas for corporations and for individuals, whether they're target subpoenas or third party subpoenas. Now, maybe all that's going to change. Maybe Carpenter signals that the, the court is ready to rethink the law of subpoenas. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. That's a superb answer to the question that I'd asked 20 years ago. How is it possible? And I anticipated that. You, you anticipated the question, years. and you've brought us up to date. And it's more relevant mm -hmm. than ever. And it is the most dramatic example of a 
subversion of the original understanding of both the Fourth and Fifth Amendments that can be imagined. At the time of the framing, a subpoena for private diaries would have been the quintessential example of a violation of the Fifth and Fourth Amendments. Today, neither amendment provides any protection, both because of the third party doctrine for the Fourth Amendment and because of the extension of Hale to private papers under the Fifth. So a few questions. Uh, why, how could this have happened? Uh, Bill Stuntz has a wonderful article from years ago about how it was a desire to keep the regulatory state up and running during the progressive era that led the court to eviscerate protection for corporate papers that had been in the high watermark in the Boyd case. You couldn't enforce uh, regulatory laws if you couldn't subpoena plate glass uh, receipts, which were the corporate papers at issue in Boyd. But why on earth did the court apply that to private papers in the 60s and right. 70s? And why, ha and why did Justice O'Connor say that private diaries had no substantive Fifth Amendment right. protection? Well, I'm glad you mentioned Bill Stuntz, um, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. But he was a brilliant interlocutor of both the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. And he did make this very important point that in Hale, the court was basically faced with the proposition that if it allowed Boyd to stand, the regulatory state would come to a screeching halt. We'd no longer be able to regulate corporations because we couldn't get the documents necessary to uh, determine whether there's been any trust violation or any other violation of all of the regulatory regimes that were set up during the progressive era. Um, but the point I was trying to make is that that decision, which arguably is very justifiable, if you believe in the regulatory state, then without much thinking it all got transferred to individual papers, including diaries. And again, I think the answer to your question is there wasn't much thought put into it. We created this body of law, making it very easy to get subpoenas in the corporate context. And then without realizing the consequences, Fisher got rid of the Fifth Amendment protection that encompassed individual records. And lo and behold, now, as I said, and as you just re repeated, there's no Fifth Amendment protection, and virtually no Fourth Amendment protection for all this personal information that resides with third parties. And I can't really provide any other explanation than that. I think it was, in, in some ways, an unconscious result of separate developments of the Fourth Amendment in the corporate context and Fifth Amendment in the, in the, in the corporate context, and then the court's decision, and I don't think this is a wrong decision necessarily in Fisher, that the Fifth Amendment's not about privacy, it's about preventing coercion. But in the meantime, uh, the court forgot, oops, we are no longer providing any restrictions on subpoenas, and that, uh, that, that applies to individuals as well as corporations. <clears throat> Why is that not a wrong decision in Fisher? Isn't mental privacy a core concern of the Fifth Amendment's uh, concern about the oath ex officio and compelling people under oath to provide answers to questions they don't I know about? I think it, that's, that's true, and the court still recognizes that, for instance, in the Hubble case. It recognizes that, but that's only if there's coercion of a mental process. Right? The Fifth Amendment only prohibits compulsion of testimony. So in Hubble, the court did recognize that if the subpoena compels, in that case Hubble, to figure out what documents the government wanted precisely and to, to, to go through all of his file cabinets to find out what the government was after, then that could be a violation of the Fifth Amendment. But the diary, for instance, the government does not compel that to be created. Now, again, the after production doctrine might come into play here. If the only way the government can show this diary came from Jeff Rosen um, is through showing that you were the one who produced it, the subpoena compels that act, and that can implicate the Fifth Amendment. But the actual content of the diary is not protected by the Fifth Amendment because you were not coerced to create it. But if I record in my diary my religious beliefs or my heresies or my uh, 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 blasphemies, and then those are introduced in court against me to prove that I'm a heretic, how is my mental privacy not coerced? Well, I, I agree with you. Your mental privacy, well, you, OK, you threw in that last word. How is your mental privacy not how am coerced? I not, how am I not coerced by my thoughts? How am I not incriminated by my thoughts? How is that you like are a paradigmatic example? Of you are incriminated by your thoughts. Um, and I think there's a very strong argument that there should be a prohibition or at least a significant limitation on getting a diary and similar kinds of documents under the Fourth Amendment or maybe under the First Amendment. Certainly you can make an argument there's a right to intellectual privacy under the First Amendment. But I think the court's probably right that given the language of the Fifth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment does not prevent what you're talking about unless somehow the government coerces you to create the document, which, by the way, I think might be true of tax records. Ironically enough, um, because every, every April 15th, you have to produce information for the government. <clears throat> so, oh, so Boyd was right because it applied to corporate papers. For the Fourth and Fifth Amendments run into each other when it comes yeah, to... Yeah, corporations have no Fifth Amendment right. Um, so that was an easy one for the... Well, 
after Hale, it's an easy one, right? Corporations are not persons. I'm sorry, though, were you asking another yeah. question? Yeah. Just that you're saying that corporate papers, ironically, might have more Fifth Amendment protection than private diaries because the government courses their production. Yes. If, if you thought that corporations were persons under the Fifth Amendment, then the, the corporation would have some Fifth Amendment protection, at least vis-a-vis -vis the act of production, and maybe vis-a-vis -vis the creation of the content of the document, if the corporation is required to create that document as part of the regulatory state, which it often is. Would the framers... But of course, corporations are not persons, so that, that okay. prevents corporations from having that protection. I, I was going to ask that, and then please jump in, unless because we're going to solve this in the, next, the remaining 10 minutes, and yeah. the document is going to be f totally fixed. But would the framers have seen corporations as persons under the Fifth Amendment? I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe someone out here does. Um, I, it, yeah, well, yeah, with Citizens United, you could say the court's moving back to the position the corporations are more or less people, but I'm pretty sure the Supreme Court's going to stick with its interpretation of person under the Fifth Amendment, because obviously the First Amendment is different from the Fifth Amendment. Um, and I think there is some colonial history suggests that corporations didn't really exist in colonial times in the sense that we talk about it now. There is some 19th century law that suggests corporations are not natural persons, and the Fifth Amendment was meant to protect testimony from natural persons. But I'm not a, 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 a definitely, I'm not an expert on that particular issue. Laura. So just on this, I, Breyer mentions, Justice Breyer mentions this in Citizens United, that, that corporations don't exist. They're not pre-existing entities in the same way that individuals are. And so there was a debate at the Constitutional Convention over who got to charter corporations. And there was this concern that giving the national government that power would give it too much power in one place. And so it was going to be done at a state level, uh, so much so that the First Bank of the United States was contested, right? So there, there was a lot of discussion as to what even was legitimate to bring in into being a corporation and who should have the power to even bring it into being. So the statement that Breyer recognizes fully in Citizens United is that that's very different than a natural individual. What I want to get back to, though, is this question of third party records and subpoena. Because you mentioned a diary in which you put your religious beliefs or your heresies, whatever they might be. Uh, now let's do that on an iPad, because that's what we use these days as an iPad. Well, under the corporate third party subpoena power, Hours, right, that you're not the target, you go to the company, there's, there's, there's an erroneous assumption going on that backs both subpoenas and the warrant and the third party, the way that they view third parties. And that's the assumption that it's voluntary in the modern world uh, not to, in fact, uh, engage in regular business activities in which your private information is entrusted to a third party. You cannot bank without it, right? You cannot uh, carry on telephone conversations. You can't keep in touch with your family. You can't uh, keep in touch with your friends without actually having a certain, certain amount of information held by third parties. And the doctrine has not yet recognized how the exact same privacies that would have been protected under the Fourth Amendment and under self-incrimination of the Fifth Amendment are now no longer protected simply by nature of the fact that we live in a digital world. And, and as you say, that makes no sense as a matter of original understanding or of our intuitions of what uh, the core of privacy is. All right, last question. It's just a small one, and then we have to end to get to the next panel. If uh, Chris, if you were coming up with a way of resurrecting a version of the protection for diaries from subpoenas that the framers took for granted, uh, you suggested you located it in the First or Fourth Amendment rather than the Fifth Amendment. What would it look like and what would the contours be? I think there should continue to be a zone of privacy. I mean, you can think about it as concentric circles. I think a diary should be in the middle of those concentric circles and maybe subjected uh, and maybe uh, given absolute protection against any government intrusion. But if not absolute protection, at least the government should have to have a very strong justification in order to get access to a diary. Then outside that circle might be other kinds of private papers. Outside that circle uh, might be, I think, any document surrendered to third party that has personal information. And outside of that circle, corporations, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And that could all be based on the idea that the Fourth Amendment and perhaps the, Fifth, the First Amendment as well uh, recognizes a zone of privacy. I think it's a very sensible proposition. I, I don't think, I think the court's probably right that it shouldn't come from the Fifth Amendment, but it's clear the Fourth Amendment protects privacy, and it's clear to me that the First Amendment protects privacy, at least to the extent uh, that speech and association interests are implicated. Great. And Laura, I guess a version of the same question to you, because you parsed the Fourth Amendment so well. If you were coming up with an alternative to the third party doctrine that would protect private diaries under the Fourth Amendment, what would it look like? 
So Justice Gorsuch, in the most recent case in Carpenter, uh, where they were dealing with cell site location information, where somebody it had been collected for 127 days, the court offered a number of factors that actually can be applied to almost any digital data, you know, which really throws into question and puts courts in a very difficult position of making social judgments about the volume, about the revealing nature, about the retroactivity. Most digital information is retroactive. It tells what you've been doing because it's a record of the past, right? The near perfect recall, the length of the time that it's collected, the precision. These were the factors that the majority decided on. And uh, Justice Gorsuch in um, his dissent, which really I think Carpenter is a five plus one because he also thought it should be protected. He said, what about bailment? What about our traditional understanding of the law of bailment, which is when you generate data or information and a company holds it, they might hold it for a purpose for which you've contracted, but they don't get ownership rights over your data. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this concept of bailment and property rights, I think there's something to be said for a but-for type analysis, where if it weren't for you, that information wouldn't exist, then you have the right to control that information under a more traditional property-based approach. Wow. Thank you for a tour de force uh, survey of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. Uh, pl please join me in thanking our panelists. That was wonderful. Thanks. Really great. Thank you. And we are now going to continue the conversation and bring it right into the uh, uh, 21st uh, century with uh, John Cook. And wonderful to see you. Welcome. Please stay nearby because you're going to have to be part of this discussion as well. Well, good morning. Um, I'm John Cook, and I have the good fortune to be the director of the Federal Judicial Center. Uh, and uh, just to say how pleased we are to partner with the National Constitution Center in this program again this year. It's been a terrific relationship and uh, always interesting programs. And welcome to, to all of you judges and, uh, and all the others who've uh, joined us this morning. Uh, in addition to Jeffrey Rosen, who will change his hat from moderator to panelist uh, uh, for this session and who needs no further introduction, we have David uh, Gray, who is the Jacob A. France Professor of Law at the Francis King Carey School of Law at the University of Maryland. Uh, and David is, like uh, our other panelists this morning, uh, uh, one of the national experts in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, we've just heard uh, a very uh, um, uh, interesting and rather uh, uh, quick tour of uh, 200 years or more of, of history uh, relating to the Fourth Amendment uh, and uh, the Fifth Amendment as well. And, uh, how, the, how warrants and subpoenas have been used to obtain uh, information uh, by, by the government through, throughout time and how that's evolved. Um, and we, we heard in particular how the Katz case in the 1960s sort of shifted the analysis in ways that uh, uh, have created uh, some different, uh, different issues for the courts and the courts have wrestled with. So in this session, we want to take it really from there uh, up, up to the present and perhaps a little bit beyond. Uh, and of course, a big part of this conversation has been the digital trail that we all leave uh, in our daily lives now and how that has evolved. Uh, so I'll begin by asking David if you would uh, take it, sort of take it from Katz and uh, you know, how has the analysis of uh, Fourth Amendment protections shifted and uh, what issues have been raised? Thanks very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I didn't prepare a PowerPoint presentation, so I was really, like, there was a little, uh, little a small piece of me that was glad to see the tech wasn't working. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about cats up to Carpenter. And I'd like to develop three themes in that conversation. Um, and it's built around the failure, the fundamental failure of the cats doctrine. So cats can be and I think should be read as of a piece with a series of Supreme Court cases that were decided at front in the middle part of the 20th century to deal with what was then a brand new government technology. And that was the professionalized paramilitary police force. We didn't have police at the founding. We didn't, even have, we didn't have police really until starting the beginning of the 19th century. And they didn't become part of the daily tableaus of our lives until well into the 20th century. 
But you see the court struggling to deal with this new government of technology that was capable of conducting investigations and getting involved in people's lives, invading their persons, houses, papers, and effects um, in order to, inf to uh, detect and prosecute crimes. And so you, Katz should be read as, think, as of a piece with cases like Miranda um, in the Fifth Amendment context, MAP um, giving, uh, uh, incorporating the exclusionary rule to the states. And at, at part, as part of that package, it had a real progressive potential. And that progressive potential was in the court's insight that maybe the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect places, it protects people. And it affected that insight in a very interesting way by creating out of whole cloth a definition of search that is found nowhere in any dictionary, even to today. That a search is an intrusion upon subjectively manifested expectations of privacy that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. Who, outside of the front two rows, would ever define search that way? <laughs> no, a search is looking for, trying to find, no, not you, Chris. Uh, looking for, trying to find, I, I, I'm searching for my keys, I'm searching for my friend on a street corner, I'm searching for a tissue in my purse. These are all normal uses of the word search, but the court created this technical definition of search in an effort to expand the scope of protections afforded by the Fourth Amendment to cover, in that case, effectively eavesdropping. And that seemed like a wonderful, wonderfully progressive move in Fourth Amendment law, but the problem was that what the court gave in 1967, it started to take away almost immediately through a series of cases that are by now pretty familiar to us. And so these are the cases that give rise to the public observation doctrine, cases like Knott's, that tell us that any time we knowing, that any time we expose to public view, anything, anything about us, that, um, any person or pro any property, that the government can do anything that a member of the public can do or for that, thing, uh, that matter, anything that a raccoon could do. So as long as law enforcement officers in a, are in a place where they lawfully have a right to be, they can, anything that they do from that lawful vantage point is not a search. And the third party doctrine, which as we learned la in the last panel tells us uh, that anything that we, know we, that we share with a third party, we have no constitutional complaint if the government gains access to that information through the third party. Um, and finally, standing doctrine. And so this is something that came out of a case called Rakus, um, where the court was very careful to talk about Fourth Amendment standing as separate from that Article Three standing requirement, but linked the right to claim a, to claim a Fourth Amendment, uh, to, to claim a right under the Fourth Amendment to personal individual rights of privacy. And through the development of these, four, uh, these three doctrines, um, the court ignored some fundamental truths about the Fourth Amendment that Laura started to expose in her talk and I'd like to make, uh, to, to make explicit here. First is that that Katz's definition of search is completely artificial. If we want to take seriously the, the Fourth Amendment as it was originally understood and as it should play a role in our, in our doc democracy going forward, we should define searches as searches, as anything, any kind of looking for, trying to find, et cetera. The second is that we should start again reading the Fourth Amendment not as a fundamental protection of privacy. Privacy doesn't appear anywhere in the text. There's really no discussion of privacy um, in, those in those founding era discussions of, of general warrants, but more it's about limitations on governmental power, and in particularly the indiscriminate use of the power to search and seize. And so those very insightful quotes that Professor Donahue um, read to you from Paxton's case and from the general warrants cases were all about the effect of granting government agents completely unfettered discretion to search and seize wherever they want, whenever they want, for good reasons, for bad reasons, or for no reasons at all. And what was the impact of granting that kind of broad and indiscriminate, unfettered governmental power? And this is the third theme. Well, it affected not just the interests of the individual subject to the search, but everybody's interests. So in Paxton's case, in all those general warrants cases, you see the courts and James Otis linking the availability of general warrants. Just that this tool is available makes all of us insecure against 
the ab abuses of governmental power. We all have to walk around worried that a, law that a government agent could intrude on our person's house, papers, effects, um, with, for good reasons, for bad reasons, or for no reasons at all, which leaves us as a people, the people, insecure in our person's houses, and papers, and effects against the use of a particular kind of governmental power, a search and a seizure. And why do those themes matter? Well, they matter because those doctrines that have come out of CATS, the public observation doctrine, the third party doctrine, the constraints on Fourth Amendment standing, have really left the courts powerless to effectuate constitutional regulations on new and emerging surveillance technology. So I've described this in, um, as an age of surveillance. Um, that's built around visual surveillance technologies like, net, like networked um, surveillance cameras, um, like drone-based surveillance cameras, um, and data surveillance like big data, uh, and, and also tracking surveillance like GPS and RFID tracking um, and cell site location information. All these are new technologies that have become more increasingly a part of the new tools that are available to professional uh, uh, police departments to conduct searches of the people, to conduct, to engage in conduct that any normal person would describe as searching, looking for, trying to find, but they fall outside of the scope of Fourth Amendment regulation because they, in the case of visual surveillance, our technologies usually are, would be protected by the public observation doctrine, by a lot of tracking technologies, by either the public top, uh, uh, observation doctrine or the third party doctrine, and in the case of a lot of big data um, type surveillance programs, um, standing limitations. And so what then is the path forward? I think that Professor Donahue uh, and I agree on this, I know that because we submitted a, a, an amicus brief in that Carpenter case arguing that the solution to our age of surveillance is not to create another artificial set of Fourth Amendment doctrines, but rather to return to a clear understanding of what the Fourth Amendment was about when it was adopted. And it was, it covered searches, as anybody would describe them. It was principally interested in constraining governmental power, and it was interested in protecting collective interests. And that is evident if we just look at the text. And so what does the Fourth Amendment say? Well, first of all, it protects the right of persons, right? No. It protects the right of who? The people. And where do we see that phrase, the people, elsewhere in the Constitution? We, the people in order to form a more perfect union. So who is the, what's the referent for the people in the preamble? The people of the United States. Why would we think that the referent for the people in the Fourth Amendment would be any different, particularly in light of that history of the General Warrants cases and Paxton's cases? And if that's not enough evidence for you, we also have the fact that um, there was a deliberate choice in the language of the Fourth Amendment. So at the time of the adoption of the Fourth Amendment, as Professor Donahue um, pointed out, most of the states had prohibitions on general warrants or search and seizure powers of one form or another. Two of them are particularly important for us. One is the Massachusetts Constitution, written by John Adams, who was lauded as the, the architect uh, of the Fourth Amendment, the intellectual architect of the Fourth Amendment, even though he didn't write it. And that Massachusetts Declaration protects the right of, quote, every subject to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Who does that protect? Every subject. You, John, me, right? No, but not, uh, and, on the other side was the Pennsylvania Constitution, which guaranteed the right of the people to be secure. Two different models available to the drafter, the, to, the, to Madison's committee. And what version was adopted? Well, the right of the people. Why wouldn't we give significance to that drafting decision and recognize that the Fourth Amendment is fundamentally about collective interest to be secure against threats posed by grants of unfettered powers to search and seize. It's about constraining governmental power. And, um, the, and what's important about that is um, that it gives us the tools that we need to bring a lot of those new technologies, the, the technologies that create our age of surveillance 
within the compass of Fourth Amendment regulation. So take something like, for example, um, cell site location information. Cell site location information is information that you voluntarily share through your, pers oops, that's a through your personal tracking device, um, your telephone, with your cell site service provider, oops, uh, with your cell site service provider. They store that information for their own business purposes, and it sits there for two years or more. That sounds like data information that you voluntarily share with a third party. What would be your complaint under CATS if the government came to the service provider and said, hey, give us that data? Well, under the third party doctrine, you'd have no Fourth Amendment com uh, complaint at all. Why? Because it's not a search. But what is the government doing when it asks for Carpenter's cell site location information or asks for my cell site lo location information? They're looking for me. They're trying to find me. Sounds like a search to me. And moreover, these things are ubiquitous, as the Chief Justice puts it in the opening line of the Carpenter case itself. There are 30, 396 million cell phone service accounts in the United States for a nation of 326 million people. Why does the Chief Justice make that the opening line of the opinion? Because it's not just about Carpenter. It's about me. I have a cell phone. You have a cell phone. We all have cell phones. And so granting law enforcement agencies, agencies unfettered ability to gain access to cell site location information threatens the security of each of us and all of us to be secure, the right of each of us and all of us to be secure against threats of unreasonable search and seizure. And if you don't believe me, listen again to the court. A little bit later in the opinion, uh, the Chief Justice revitalizes a thread of Fourth Amendment law that had laid fallow since 1967 and quotes Justice Jackson's opinion in DeRay to say that the Fourth Amendment seeks to secure the privacies of life against arbitrary power and to place obstacles in the way of too permeating police surveillance. We're worried about the ability of these technologies to threaten each of us and all of us. We're worried about giving government unfettered discretion to engage in searches and seizures. And CSLI, that cell site location information, facilitates that kind of broad and indiscriminate surveillance. Again, don't trust me, trust the Chief Justice. Seismic shifts in digital technology have made possible the tracking not only of Carpenter's location, but also everyone else's, not for short periods of time, but for years and years. It's about all of us. Not only that, but it, it facilitates pervasive surveillance. Cell phones, almost a, almost a feature of human anatomy, track exactly the movements of its owner achieving near-perfect surveillance as if the government had attached an ankle monitor to the phone's user. And it facilitates that indiscriminate surveillance, right? So there's no particularity. Police need not know in advance whether they want to follow a particular individual or when. Whoever the suspect turns out to be, he has effectively been tailed every moment of every day for five years. The police may, in the government's view, call upon the results of that surveillance without regard to the constraints of the Fourth Amendment. So what do we see in Carpenter? Yes, we see a lot of very difficult to follow, maybe technical factors um, that courts might have to uh, deploy in analyzing technologies um, as they come in, uh, as they're subject to different Fourth Amendment um, challenges. But what we see, I think, is a fundamental return to what the Fourth Amendment was and always should have been about. It's a, not about the rights necessarily of individuals. It's about collective rights. It's not about privacy and necessarily, it's about search. And it's not ab about an individual's right to their privacy, but about our collective interest in constraining governmental power to search and seize so that each of us and all of us can go about our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, secure in our person's house's papers and effects against threats of unreasonable search. Thank you, David. I know Jeff is chomping at the bit here, but I'm gonna ask one <laughs> follow-up question for David. Um, because I think uh, the last panel touched on this too, on CATS. CATS seems to be, it's the kind of the, the pivotal case here, and uh, there's, there, there's been some criticism of the, under, of the rationale, the reasonable expectation of privacy rationale. And just for those uh, in the audience who may not be familiar, CATS 
was decided in 1967, and it involved the, the police placing a listening device on the exterior of a phone booth that w enabled the police to hear what was being said inside the phone booth, and they heard cats uh, uh, relaying gambling information uh, from inside the booth, and that was used against him in his, in his trial. So if, if, if the court went off, went off in the wrong direction in cats and it's an analysis, my question is, was the result correct in your opinion or not, should, should the evidence have been admissible? Um, and if, the, if it was, uh, if the result was correct, what should they have said was the rationale for it? And, and so the, the, the reasoning should have gone something like this. So first of all, is attaching a listening device on the outside of a phone booth in order to eavesdrop on somebody's conversations, is that a search? And it seems to me straightforward that of course it is, right? They're looking for, they're trying to find information, they're trying to gather information. All of that is the sort of thing that we would say, well, sounds like a search to me. And that should be a pretty minimal threshold. One of the, the big problems with cats is it conflated searches and unreasonable searches. And so a search is a search is a search. Let, it, let, and so that's a search, no problem. Then the next question is, if we follow the, the historical guidance of the Fourth Amendment, can we grant law enforcement agencies unfettered discretion to deploy and use eavesdropping and wiretapping technologies while still preserving the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against threats of unreasonable search and seizure? And the answer to that seems to me straightforward, absolutely not. Um, and an easy way to see that is to strike a contrast between, uh, say, a law enforcement officer tailing, so human tailing of a suspect um, versus technologies like wiretapping, eavesdropping, um, and contemporary tracking technologies. So can we afford to give a, a cop on the street unfettered discretion to decide to follow somebody for a few blocks? without threatening the security of the people? Absolutely. There are only so many of them. And that limited resource means that they have to make some kind of strategic and informed and rational decision about how to deploy that limited and expensive resource. And so giving them unfettered discretion to conduct human tailing, that doesn't really pose much of a collective threat, um, at least until we get into a, 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 an informant society. But by contrast, look at these technologies like wiretapping and contemporary tracking technologies. They're cheap, they're infinitely scalable, and, and both in terms of their deployment and the ability to gather and analyze that information. Anybody seen the wire? Um, and, and, and CSLI for that matter. Um, and, does, and by virtue of that alone, it seems to pose a collective threat in a way that human surveillance, human tailing, human surveillance does not. And then add into that the fact of the self-adoption of these tracking technologies. The Chief Justice is absolutely right to start that Carpenter opinion by saying like, this is, all, this is us now, we are, this is part of us, this is our cell phone, it's an extension of us in a way um, so that you know, what if the, the government could, uh, could deploy an individual drone to follow us around. That's kind of what they're doing if they have unfettered access to cell site location information. So if you focus on the means and the method and ask questions about scalability, um, it's, it, the, the nature of the information that it, that it gathers, um, its, its expense, and, and these kinds of questions, then it gives you a clue into what kinds of means and methods should be subject to some kind of Fourth Amendment restraint and what not. Um, and embedded in your, your question was the, the right outcome in terms of the remedy. And this is something where I think this is the one place where Professor Donna, you and I actually uh, part ways. Uh, my own view is that the Fourth Amendment is agnostic on remedies. The warrant um, clause describes a Fourth Amendment remedy that's very attractive, but I'm more interested in why it's attractive. It's prospective. It's parsimonious, um, it's effective, it's enforceable, those, and as a means of constraining governmental power. But are there other ways to constrain that governmental power? Sure, I think that there are. Um, and a good example of that might be um, Carpenter itself. So one of the arguments left on the table by the government and Carpenter was when it, whether 2703D is constitutionally sufficient. Probably not, because it doesn't have a particularity requirement but I don't think there's anything necessary about that probable cause requirement, for example. And so 
reasonable suspicion is demonstrably grounds for some searches and seizures in some circumstances. Could reasonable, suspicious, reasonable suspicion demonstrated to a court um, holding law enforcement officers accountable, having some kind of a particularity requirement, would that be constitutionally sufficient for accessing cell site location information? Quite possibly, quite possibly. Um, and so that's the, and so I, I think Katz was r rightly decided for the wrong reasons, um, but I, I still have questions about whether the, the warrant um, requirement and the exclusionary rule were the right prospective remedies to deploy in that case. Professor Rosen is, and Prof President and Professor Rosen is not only an expert in the Constitution generally, but I know the Fir Fourth Amendment is a particular area of interest to you. So, um, you have comments on what David has said, or, you, or what else would you like to say about this era since Katz and how how the Fourth Amendment has developed? Uh, yes, uh, I do have comments. I listened to David's proposal with the greatest interest. And what David Gray is attempting to do is to provide an answer to the doctrinal dilemma that we were discussing in the first panel, namely how is it that the Fourth Amendment uh, once uh, devoted to prevent a critic of the government from having his private diaries searched now provides no such protection. And David Gray argues uh, powerfully that rather than focusing on the content of the information, namely the fact that it's a diary, or the duration of the search, uh, how long it goes on, or even the amount of different amounts of information that can be aggregated, we should focus on the method of the search, and in particular, regulate technology that gives the government essentially unrestrained ability to uh, collect an awful lot of data in ways that threatens the right of all of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. And he says that the key question is whether the means and methods used by the police provide an unlimited license to deploy and use modern technologies. So I think it's a great contribution to uh, an urgently important constitutional question and deserves close attention. Thinking aloud and on my feet, because I've not uh, had the chance to consider this before, I uh, think it's a promising way forward it suggests limitations to uh, the, some of the alternatives the court is considering, including the bailment theory. Justice Gorsuch made a very uh, important attempt to relocate uh, Fourth Amendment protections in property rights and to suggest that when we turn over our papers to third parties, we shouldn't assume that they uh, take property interests in them. That has limits because the service contracts might be written so that uh, we surrender our property interests to third parties. And David Gray suggests that even if that's the case and we don't have a property interest, if a broad-based government search would threaten the ability of all citizens to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, it might be unreasonable. I think uh, my questions about David Gray's theory are whether it puts exclusive emphasis on the collective right of the people to be free from unregulated rummaging and not enough emphasis on the right of the individual to have some substantive protection for private papers. Remember, Laura Donahue identified two interests that James Otis denounced during the writs of assistance. One was the fear that we might be reduced to uh, we, uh, we, 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 the villainy that the government might through villainous unregulated rummaging, as Justice Harlan so memorably put it, the unregulated rummaging of the petty bureaucrat have our collective security undermined when we're not sure whether a mass subpoena for our phone records or data or cell phone records could threaten any one of us. That's the central interest he's focusing on. But there's also the danger that we might be uh, reduced to mental slavery, that the fear of a targeted search of us, of me, if I were a critic of the government, of my own heretical diaries, might inhibit me from recording my criticisms in, at all in the first place, and therefore might make me less secure in my persons, houses, papers, and effects. I am not sure that I see a need to choose between those two Fourth Amendment interests. Because just as Brandeis didn't choose, he's of course my touchstone in all of matters of uh, translating the Fourth Amendment in light of new digital technologies. And in his immortal concurrence in the Olmstead case, uh, 
he anticipated the new technologies that we're talking about now. He said, uh, focusing on the age of wiretapping, ways may someday be developed by which it's possible without physically intruding into the home to extract secret papers from desk drawers and introduce them into court. Advances in psychic and mental uh, intrusions may make it possible to expose the content of men's minds. At the time of the framing, a far smaller intrusion was considered a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Can it be that the Constitution provides no such protection today? So Brandeis is centrally focusing on fMRI technologies. <laughs> He's anticipating uh, uh, Skype. He, 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 his law clerk, Henry Friendly, had a clip about a new technology television. It was 1927. But Brandeis misunderstood television. He thought it was a two-way technology where you could see people on both sides of the screen. He anticipated webcams. And uh, Friendly said, you can't just look through a TV camera and see someone on the other side of the screen. Now, of course, you can. Brandeis admitted the, omitted the reference to television, but was sensitive to this one-on-one -on -one form of synchronous uh, spying and rummaging and intrusion on the individual in ways that would threaten the individual's mental privacy. And that was why Brandeis's test was just the text itself. He, he wanted to ask whether a particular search makes us less secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects, which both regulates the centrally important interest in uh, the means of the search and protects our collective interests and also the individual interest in mental privacy. I think the rubber might hit the road in terrorism cases. And this is why Professor Donahue's discussion of use restrictions was so important. So Germany, which has an acute understanding of the dangers of totalitarian surveillance uh, throughout the 20th century, gives its intelligence services broad discretion to search phone records and other data without a particularized warrant. But it doesn't allow the intelligence services to turn that information over to the police for law enforcement unless they find evidence of a serious crime, like murder or terrorism, not a, a domestic offense or offenses related to thought crimes that might be contained in diaries. And that kind of use restriction is the sort of judgment that juries used to make at the time of the framing when they would decide whether John Wilkes's private diaries should be protected and whether the government should have to pay damages for engaging in trespass. Now that most cases don't go to jury trials, we don't have those sort of balancings. And that's why the Germans allow lots of collection, but only for serious crimes and not for lower level crimes. That's a version of reintroducing the concern of individual mental privacy and allowing mass searches when they find evidence of serious crimes and not low-level crimes. That's just one stab at it. Um, but I, I don't see this as a um, either-or situation. The truth is that the courts are hungry for a, a, a clear test. And the I think David Gray is right that the uh, and, and Laura Donahue as well, that the number of interests that the court identified in Carpenter are hard for lower courts to balance. Duration, uh, method, mosaic, content. You, the lower courts, are hungry, no doubt, for guidance. And that's why I think it will be so important this afternoon in our private discussions for you to talk about what you found helpful and what alternatives might be. Several of you have offered really thoughtful balancing tests for regulating electronic searches of computers and cell phones. All our attempts to balance the same values, the collective and individual interests. If a focus on the method of collection is easier to apply, that might well do the trick. But somehow, you must, and I think this is my uh, charge to you, if I can presume to give it, it is urgently important that the federal courts translate the original understanding of the Fourth Amendment so that it protects as much privacy and security for our persons, houses, papers, and effects in the 21st century as the framers took for granted in the 18th. The Supreme Court is trying to do that. It is inspiring that these Fourth Amendment decisions are unanimous, are nearly so. Riley, what a, what a beautiful decision that was, all nine justices quoting James Otis with Chief Justice Roberts and not allowing the police to search a cell phone willy-nilly on arrest. 
Uh, this is a bipartisan issue that the courts can converge around. Carpenter was an interesting splintering of reasoning around a common result, uh, and all of these suggestions are good. But I, I, my, my hope uh, as the host with John Cook of this important gathering is that you'll use the next couple of uh, days, today and tomorrow, to really think through this hardest of all questions that you have some of the finest scholars in the country trying to think through with you so that you will answer Brandeis's challenge and protect the same amount of privacy today as the framers took for granted back then. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I want to follow up on one of the points David made and ask both of you. you, you you, you raise the very important question of, of the difference between what is a search and what is a reasonable search. And I think we tend to blur that in a lot of the, a lot of the thinking about this. In the example you gave of a, a police officer uh, or police uh, tailing individuals uh, individually using you know, no technology, using their cars, um, it, I take it that that would be a search but a reasonable search uh, under your definition because they are searching, they're looking for something. Is that, is that where you would, is that where the line drawn or where is the line? Uh, so that's a great question. If I, if I can have a 30 second aside uh, to say, to pivot, as okay. they say in, the, in politics, um, then I'll, I promise to come okay. back and ask your question directly. And so I just want to say, I, I don't have any cavil at all with the claim, with the proposition that collective rights also um, derogate into individual protections. And so take, for example, the Article I, Section 2 guarantee of the right of the people of the states to elect their representatives. That's a right of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to elect their representatives. Um, and, but it's not a right of persons of Pennsylvania to elect their representatives. Oh, what it, but it were true, right? If I could select my own representative um, without having to deal with, my, uh, with other members of the electorate, that'd be fantastic. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, that means that individuals have to have a right to participate and contribute meaningfully to that selection process, and we've just interpreted that as a right, an individual right to vote. And so that Article I, Section 2 collective right guarantees individual rights in service of that collective interest. And so I think it's absolutely true that there is a dialogue um, between collective and individual rights. Um, and so if you have an individual right to be, uh, not to be coerced into giving a confession, that also has collect, uh, uh, guarantees collective interest in limiting the power of the state to, to prosecute and punish. Um, and so to your particular question, so I think that when we talk about what constitutes a reasonable search, um, if we look at the dictionaries um, from the founding era, they all define reasonableness as, uh, as justified by good and sufficient reasons, not exorbitant, not overclaiming, this sort of thing. And so could a law enforcement officer see somebody and say, wow, that is a really nice suit. I'm gonna follow this guy around and see if I can figure out where he gets his suits and you know, follow him around for two or three, uh, for five or 10 minutes. Is that a good and sufficient reason for a government agent to search by following somebody, looking for them, trying to find them in the street? And I think absolutely not. That is, of course, an unreasonable search. The question is, can we grant government agents the discretion to sometimes engage in unreasonable searches using human surveillance without threatening the right of the people to be secure in their person's houses, papers, and effects, et cetera? And I think the answer to that is yes. We can afford to give them that unfettered discretion, even though sometimes it will be uh, abused. Um, but it's quite different when we get into other means and methods, um, like physical intrusions into home, physical searches of homes, so, uh, tracking using cell site location information, um, and so forth. And so the, when we think about how we protect the right of that people to be secure against the threat of unreasonable searches, we're really start talking about the prospective remedies that limit government access to that means and method. So we'll just take for granted, we're, gonna, we're not gonna limit their ability to engage in um, searches and, and human surveillance, except if they're harassing somebody uh, toward action um, retrospectively. But prospectively, how can we limit government, act, uh, government access to, to means and methods? Um, that should be subject to Fourth Amendment regulation. One, me one prospective remedy is the warrant requirement, right? Gotta go to court. And what happens when you go to court? You have to demonstrate probable cause. You have to show good and sufficient reasons 
for me to use this means and method in this case. You have to particularly describe the places to be searched and the persons and the people to be seized. You have to say, this is what I'm looking for and no more. I am interested in documenting the proximity of this suspect to five robberies. I want 127 days of their cell site location information. What? No, you don't get that. That's exorbitant. It's more than you need. It's unreasonable. I want their cell site location information for two hours on either side of these robberies. Okay, now we're talking. That is a reasonable use of that power to search and seize. And so that warrant requirement provides us with a good model for the kinds of remedies that can guarantee that means and methods subject to Fourth Amendment regulation are only being used for re to conduct reasonable searches. And the tools that are there, I think, are very informative. One, you got to give good and sufficient reasons to a neutral third party who is going to hold you accountable. And you have to specify where you're going to search and what you're going to and what you're looking for. And if we put those kinds of limitations in one form or another, on these means and methods, I think most of us are able to walk around secure that as a group, we're limiting in a country of limited governmental power and individually that I can afford to engage in my heresy. I love that you confessed heresy on live television, a uh, live webcam. I didn't uh, confess I, it, that, I said that, I might engage in that it. I can be, that I can be secure in my heresy uh, and my ability to associate with individuals of my choosing, um, to seek medical care that I need, um, and all of, and because I've got that prospective remedy that's limiting governmental access to those means and methods. And so just as another sort of technological example, um, there are a number of cases, um, and I think the, the one that I was uh, most recently thinking about was the, uh, reading about was in the first circuit of pharmaceutical databases that are, are maintained by states. So um, pharmacists, when they're fulfilling prescriptions, have to put information about the prescription they're fulfilling in the database, um, and um, the state keeps that information, I think, and they use it as a screen sometimes to make sure that people aren't abusing the system and so forth. The DEA has been going around the country and asking to just scrape all that data. We want all of it. Give it to us on a subpoena because we want to try to find people who are abusing opiates or writing too many prescriptions for opiates. And um, in this case, um, it's a noble bureaucrat who was the recipient of that subpoena who said, no, bring me a warrant. And she lost in the district court and she's now in front of the, the First Circuit. Um, but that seems to me precisely the kind of means and methods that should be subject to real Fourth Amendment restraint. If D agents want that information, they got to come to a court, a neutral arbiter, and provide good and sufficient reasons for the precise information that they want. They got to tell a story about how they're going to be held responsible to the court, what they're going to do if, if they get information they're not supposed to have, or what they're going to do with information about innocent individuals. All of these are the kinds of questions that would be asked in a warrant or warrant-like process that aren't asked if they have unfettered power to just issue a subpoena and scrape data um, about what kind of prescriptions you've received in the last year, which for some of us, we would regard as individual, as a, a concern of individual privacy. Um, but collectively, um, that would leave all of each of us and all of us pretty insecure in our, in our persons. I'm going to exercise my moderator's prerogative to steal a little bit of time from the next panel, which I'm also moderating, <laughs> so we can keep a, keep the, continue this discussion for a few more minutes. I assure you that I recognize your constitutional right to a 15-minute break, so we will get a full 15-minute break. I think that's the, I don't know, the 28th Amendment or something. Like <laughs> um, but I, I, the, you've, you talked about you know, scraping you know, medical data and so forth. We think of the Fourth Amendment in terms of, of criminal prosecutions. That's typically what police are searching for evidence of. And of course, the exclusionary rule, which is the primary enforcement mechanism, is used in criminal cases. But especially given the, the plethora of data that's available about all of us now, and the specter of big brotherism, 
that, that, that that raises. There are other uses that the government might make of, of our, our information that we may not want it to use. So should, uh, should we continue to think of the Fourth Amendment in, in terms of criminal law and, uh, and uh, searches for criminal purposes? Or does your, does your, um, your approach to it uh, also take into account these other potential uses that the government might make that we should be secure, the people should be secure against. And I'm going to start with Jeff because he's, yes, please. Uh, he's had less time to talk about this. It's certainly true that uh, the greatest threat to our security and our persons, houses, papers, and effects is not from subpoenas or warrants or searches by the government, but by the data that we voluntarily turn over to social media companies and is revealed to the world. And that is why the question of how to regulate uh, both free speech and privacy in an age when Mark Zuckerberg has more power than either the president or the Supreme Court is a serious one. And I do think, uh, John, that your challenge or your suggestion that uh, we think about ways that we must be made secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects from being taken out of context on the basis of information revealed in one purpose that's exposed for another is central. That's one of the values that privacy protects, not just the ability to conceal criminal activity or even to have our uh, most personal papers like our diaries sacrosanct, but not to be judged in one context on the basis of information revealed in another. There's that powerful word, synecdoche, uh, confusing the part for the whole. And that's what happens when all that you, the first thing you know about someone is the worst thing that they've done, or a, uh, you, you know that they uh, listen to a particular kind of book or music and judge them as one kind of person, but in fact they're another. So I, I think that's crucially important. The, uh, just to be uh, descriptive, the privacy debate is in complete uh, flux, I would say. Uh, there was a, in the dawn of the internet in 2000, a lot of concern about regulating the companies. Uh, in, in the following decade, concern about uh, post 9-11 government surveillance. But now people have a strong sense that really their concern is not so much government searches, but the platforms without a clear sense of what to do about it. So as judges, you can be sensitive to that reality. And uh, perhaps if you come up with a model for regulating government searches, it might be adopted by society to restrict the ways that the companies can make use of it. But ultimately, it's a question of social norms and whether we will decide to allow people to be canceled or shamed or destroyed or have their lives transformed on the basis of snippets of information taken out of context. That's ultimately not a question of state power, but of social norms. David? And so this is one of the um, features of the Fourth Amendment uh, is that it only applies to governmental agents, um, or so the doctrine tells us. There's nothing necessarily in the text of the Fourth Amendment that um, suggests that it only applies to state agents, but that seems pretty well settled, um, and perhaps uh, Professor Donahue has a different view on this, but I haven't seen anything in the history of the Fourth Amendment to suggest that it would regulate um, private agencies. Um, and this is one of the things that the, the Chief Justice for the majority in Carpenter is remarkably fuzzy about. So there are two fundamental questions that the Chief Justice just ducks in the majority opinion. What was the search? Was the search the gathering of the data? Was the search the subpoenaing of the data? Was the search the receipt of the data? Was the search the analysis and looking through the data? Where was the search? When did the search happen? The Chief Justice never tells us. And that matters because he also doesn't tell us who did the search. Um, and in dissent, both Justice Thomas and Justice Kennedy are up in arms about this, um, taking aim, um, helpfully for me, uh, against the collective rights reading of the Fourth Amendment and saying, you know, the Fourth Amendment is all about individual rights and this is, uh, and, and the court just ignores the fact by essentially granting Carpenter a right in documents that are owned by and possessed by his cell site location, uh, his cell phone, cell phone service provider. 
And so where was the search and who did it? And the Chief Justice's answer is, look at this technology, but the technology. And it's an, it, there's an unhelpful lack of clash there. And this is something that I think the court and courts are gonna be struggling with in the years to come, which is what is the relationship between a Facebook or a Google um, or a Microsoft that's hit by thousands, tens of thousands of requests by the government for user information every year. Are they a government agent by virtue under the Strickland test? Um, or are they a private entity um, that exercises its own business interests? And the, the Carpenter suggests that, well, we're not gonna make cell so for service providers, Facebook, we're not gonna call them government agents exactly but we're gonna have a warrant requirement that seals things off. Um, but increasingly, as we have this expansion, um, and Jeffrey, this extraordinarily insightful comment that more and more the, the governmental agents in our lives are corporations. Um, and so what are we gonna do about their ability to effectuate unreasonable searches and seizures that enforce um, constraining powers, uh, as Professor Donahue pointed out, uh, on our ability to, uh, to, uh, to engage in ethical self-development um, and freedom of thought and so forth. Um, and these are big questions, these are big social questions that I don't think have a clear Fourth Amendment answer. Um, and so I think we have to leave it to our fully functional Congress, right? Um, to figure it out or, or to the people themselves, and so there are a lot of self-help tools that are available out there if people would only recognize that they can exercise a lot of power in protecting their own privacy. So don't give Lyft unfettered access to your location information. Um, turn Google tracking off. Um, these are all things, encrypt your phone. These are all things that we can do um, to, uh, to subjectively manifest, to go back to that cat's language our expectations of privacy, even as against non-governmental agents. Thank you both. We will now take a 15-minute break. And if, if anybody's interested in, uh, I have a, a few copies of a, a forthcoming essay that kind of covers um, some of what I was talking about with Carpenter up here on the front. Thanks.
<clears throat> Welcome back. For this third session uh, this morning, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We've been listening to uh, people who have studied the Fourth Amendment intensely uh, for a long time and have traced its, its history and looked at some of its intricacies. Uh, now we're going to speak with a, a couple of federal judges who uh, deal with the Fourth Amendment uh, among many other things uh, in their daily lives. Um, but uh, they, they do have to deal with it uh, primarily uh, through the issuance of search warrants or the uh, handling of motions to exclude evidence that was allegedly obtained by, through an illegal uh, search or seizure and also occasionally in uh, civil actions where a party may allege that, that he or she's uh, um, Fourth Amendment rights have been violated and that they're entitled to some form of uh, remedy. So I'm joined uh, on my far left by Judge Frank Whitney. He is not uh, Judge David Hurd, as is uh, often the case with judges. Uh, Judge Hurd had an emergency arise and Judge Whitney graciously agreed to step in at the at the almost, uh, at the 11th hour at least. Uh, judge Whitney uh, has been a district judge in the, st in the Western District of North Carolina for about 13 years, I guess, and is currently the chief judge uh, of that district. And then to my immediate left is Magistrate Judge Lisa Lenahan. Judge Lenahan is a magistrate judge in the Western District of Pennsylvania out of Pittsburgh. And uh, she's been on the bench for about 15 years, I believe. So a lot of, a lot of experience with, uh, with these issues. And for the benefit of our public audience, I'd like uh, each of them to explain a little bit about uh, certain aspects of, the, of their role and uh, how they deal with the Fourth Amendment. And I'll start with uh, Judge Lenahan because magistrate judges are typically the people who, uh, are, who to whom police uh, and law enforcement people uh, officials come uh, seeking a warrant. So would you tell us a little bit about your role as a magistrate judge and how that works? Sure. Um, so uh, magistrate judges, if you've ever heard of us on the federal level, are not appointed by the president like all the other district court judges are. Um, we are selected by the sitting district judges in our district. And we do exist in, I think, almost every district in the country. We have a lot of overlap with the district judges in the civil cases. Um, we handle a lot of civil matters as they do. But for the criminal matters, we are not permitted by the Constitution because we are not appointed by the president to try any felony criminal cases. However, what we do is all the preliminary work. So when there's a search warrant, like we've been talking about today, um, we review those and sign those, arrest warrants, initial appearances, arraignments, and then deciding if someone should be released on bond or detained until trial. And once that process is over in most courts, the case then goes to the district judge, like Judge Whitney, and they sort of take it from there and handle the issues that may arise from that. And uh, for a, a typical search warrant application, how does that process work? Right. So. Let me just, just for the non-judges, non-lawyers here, just give you a little background. I like to think of the, the process for the government to obtain information as sort of a pyramid. So at the very top, the, the highest degree of requirement of a showing of cause would be a Title III wiretap where you're listening to somebody talk right at the moment. Those are things that the district court would deal with. But the next level would be the Rule 41 probable cause warrant. So everybody's heard about it. Do you have probable cause? The FBI shows up. They slap the warrant out. We have, do you have a warrant? Yes, I do. Here it is. And then below that, there are other levels, which we'll get to later and which have been alluded to by the professors who have spoken to you today. So for a, a warrant application, it's Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41, and it lays it all out. And basically what it is is a law enforcement officer or an attorney for the government, and usually it's both, can come to a magistrate judge in the district <clears throat> and ask for a warrant to show evidence of a crime, contraband or fruits of a crime, illegally possessed items, 
property designated for use in committing a crime, or a person who would be arrested. So what happens is, in practical uh, terms, I would get, usually via email, but sometimes hand delivery, an affidavit. And the affidavit would be signed by, not signed, would have a signature line for an agent. So it could be FBI, it could be Homeland Security, sometimes it could be a postal inspector because we get a lot of warrants for packages. And then I would review that affidavit and determine, is there probable cause? So that's sort of the rub, right? You've all heard it, everybody's heard it. What is it? I mean, it's what is probable cause? Honestly, it's not that hard of a thing to prove, as you might think. Um, the Supreme Court in Illinois v. Gates says, probable cause to search is a fair probability, fair probability, that contraband or evidence of a crime will be found in a particular place. That's it. So I read that affidavit and I need to determine is there a probable cause. And then the agent and the assistant US attorney will show up in my chambers and I will swear the agent is everything that is in this affidavit true. He, will, he or she will say yes it is, they'll sign it, I'll sign it, the US attorney will present warrants, I sign the warrant and then it goes off to execution. And how often uh, in that process do you have questions for them uh, that, that, that they then have to fill in the blanks uh, for you to be satisfied? So I would say sometimes, but the really important thing is that everything that I base my decision on has to be in the documents. So if I say, well, look, I don't know about this. You know, I don't really think you have enough to search mom's room in the house of this alleged drug dealer. You're telling me that the son's a drug dealer and you have evidence, but mom's in the house and you want to search mom's room too, and I don't think you have that. And they say, well, judge, we really do because, you know, we heard mom talking on one of the wiretaps where she says that she's going to cover, you know, the deal while son is off doing whatever. Well, that has to be in the warrant. Okay, you, I can't sign that warrant because if that warrant goes to a motion to suppress before Judge Whitney, as he will tell you, he can only look at what is in that warrant. Um, and let me just, just to point out some other things. I just described to you a process, right? And I said there were basically three people in the room, okay? The agent, the government lawyer, and me. So who's not in the room? Right, the defendant, the person who's being searched. There's nobody in that room for that defendant. So it is really, really important that the magistrate judge make sure that there's probable cause to search that person's home, their phone, their car, you know, whatever it might be. Um, there's a case, Supreme Court decided U.S. versus Leon all the way back in 1984 that pretty much says the district court has to give great deference, great deference to the magistrate judge's signing of a warrant. So once I sign a warrant, it's probably going to be upheld, even if maybe the search, maybe I shouldn't have signed the warrant, honestly. Um, the judges are kind of hamstrung, and I think Judge Whitney can, can allude to that. So when we, I mean, there's some judges here with me, we teach new magistrate judges. We always say to them, you are the Fourth Amendment because it is really up to you to protect the rights of that person who is being searched. Thank you. So Judge Whitney, uh, as, as the district judge, uh, you typically see a Fourth Amendment case uh, in a motion, motion to suppress evidence. Um, and that, uh, at more likely than not, that motion is being made over evidence that was seized, not pursuant to a warrant, but through some other, right. some, some other means. Would you describe that process and what, it, what a typical case might look like? And, uh, I'll get to that in just one moment. Let me quickly um, explain my position okay. in, in this, this orderly process of uh, a probable cause determination mm -hmm. and a review. Um, district judges and magistrate judges are journalists. We handle lots and lots of different substantive matters. In the morning, I can be handling a summary judgment motion for an employment dispute. Uh, in the mid-afternoon, I can be handling a, a, a 
uh, a, a social security case. At the end of the day, I might have a suppression hearing dealing with the Fourth Amendment matter. So I've gone through all these different uh, um, subject matters of law, and I'm getting to the end of the day, I'm tired, and I'm also dealing with uh, you know, a serious Fourth Amendment issues dealing with, with privacy. Um, so as a generalist, uh, I'm shooting from the hip. Uh, circuit judges are our academics, and we appreciate them being our academics. Uh, I come from a world where my goal in life is harmless error. The circuit judges understand that. <laughs> so a circuit judge and a district judge went out on a duck hunt. And the circuit judge sees off in the distance a sil silhouette of what looks like a duck. And he says, you know, I see that build. That does look like a duck. Then he hears, quack, quack. And he says, sounds like a duck. And then he sees the, the duck flapping his wings and says, acts like a duck. So he lifts up his shotgun, aims in on the duck. With one shot, boom, the duck falls over. The circuit judge goes up, picks up his duck, is happy, throws him in his little duck bag, and they go walking on to the uh, hunt. Bang, bang! The uh, district judge turns to the circuit judge after he just fired two rounds, says, hope it's a duck. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I come from in this process. The scholars are at the circuit level, and, and the magistrate judges are the individuals protecting the Fourth Amendment. So what do I do? Well, let me break it into uh, two parts. My review of searches with warrants and my review of warrantless searches. Uh, the warrantless searches is where the district judges really get involved. At the, when there's a search pursuant to a warrant, as uh, Judge Linhan referred to, we follow the guidance from Illinois v. Gates, a 1983 Supreme Court case, that says we are supposed to give great deference to a magistrate judge finding a probable cause. In fact, it's presumed valid so long as there's a substantial basis to support the, the warrant. And a substantial basis for the non-lawyer sounds like a lot of evidence. But for the lawyers, we know substantial basis isn't that much. It's just can we look at the affidavit supporting that warrant, and if there's anywhere in there sufficient uh, facts uh, or allegations that would support uh, the magistrate judge's issuance of the warrant, we, um, we have to find the warrant was appropriate. Uh, and we do because the federal magistrate judges take their jobs very seriously and do a very good job. And they frequently uh, send uh, the agents and the AUSAs back to say, you didn't get to that mother's room. You need a little bit more. Now that doesn't show up in a record anywhere. We know that happens though because it does happen. Magistrate judges are telling the uh, uh, government to go get a little bit more evidence when they need it. Um, it doesn't show up in the record because there's no filings there. So everything comes to the magistrate judge or if a district judge might be handling the, uh, the warrant request, the warrant application. It comes, uh, and it gets reviewed and once it's signed, it gets filed. So, so there, there's uh, some give or take a little bit, but it, uh, where the magistrate judges are asking the, uh, the government and uh, both the AUSA and the uh, agent to produce a little bit more. So uh, we have a, a valid warrant that follows the actual requirements of the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, I think, is unique because it describes what you need other amendments don't describe what you need, but if you're getting a search or seizure warrant, no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, which you've already talked about, which is, as you said, just fair probability, more than incidental, more than fortuitous, just a little bit more. It doesn't take much to have probable cause. It's a low standard, but the standard is not there to make the government prove its case. The standards there is to protect against the general warrant, the old English general warrant that we had a great presentation up here earlier this morning. And, and that's why we had this actually in the Fourth Amendment. To, so the probable cause has to be supported by oath or affirmation. You know, that's asking an agent to swear. So an agent is putting his or her, you know, j career and maybe liberty in jeopardy if they commit perjury. Um, and 
and particularity. The particularity describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. And that particularity goes right back to that general warrant concept. That general warrant was done to facilitate fe uh, felony investigations, but it was with disregard to everybody else. If a, a, a law enforcement officer 300 years ago um, thought in good faith that uh, he or she could search someone's home because he thinks they might be involved in criminal activity and just acts on his or her own kind of uh, request for a general warrant, you know, that's there to protect the innocent. That's there to protect all of us from uh, intrusion by the government. The government certainly has a right to carry on legitimate criminal investigations, but it does not have the right you know, to violate our uh, you know, persons, houses, papers, and effects. So rarely do searches with warrants get heavily contested. They get contested when there's an allegation of callous or reckless disregard for the truth. That's under Franks v. Delaware. So you're actually saying the agent uh, disregarded the truth or nearly disregarded the truth. Um, or in the cases of changing law. And so we do have, um, maybe we'll have an evidentiary hearing, but certainly maybe have a, a, a hearing discussing the evolution of the law or any Franks v. Delaware allegations. If there's a bona fide Franks v. Delaware allegation, the, uh, uh, the defense has to make a substantial preliminary, preliminary showing to get over, uh, to, to, to take it to the next step of actually having a, a hearing uh, questioning the legitimacy of the, uh, the agent's acts. And then finally, when we have uh, a warrant, uh, we have the, the Leon good faith exception that you referred to. So if a law enforcement officer does his or her job and properly goes to a magistrate judge to get a warrant and relies in good faith on that warrant and the for, or warrant is facially valid, then even if a, later on there might be a, a, a determination by another court, me or the for, uh, circuit, that there isn't probable cause, the uh, evidence will probably not be suppressed because of the Leon exception. So that's where there is a warrant. It, it, there's, there's a big difference between where there is a warrant and when there is no warrant. It's a warrantless search. Now there are times to collect evidence. Uh, officers, agents have to act with uh, urgency. Uh, there is an exigent circumstance that requires them to, to formulate their own probable cause uh, and, and to uh, enter into a property that uh, there might be evidence being destroyed. So if it's July and there's smoke coming out of a chimney in the middle of July, which would seem to be odd, but an officer has been told by a confidential informant, hey, that house, they, uh, uh, they have marijuana, and I've been to that house and bought marijuana there once or twice, and the smoke is pouring out of the, uh, the fire, uh, fireplace of the house, an officer is going to sit there and go, if I don't get in there quickly, all the evidence is going to be burned up. So that's the exigent circumstance. Those are times where uh, officers and agents have to act to protect uh, an investigation. But undoubtedly, a good defense counsel is going to seek to uh, suppress that type of evidence because there was not a warrant issued up front. So we have both an evidentiary hearing where uh, both parties present evidence, and then there's a, a findings of fact by the court, and those findings of fact are then applied to the, the, what the law is at that time. And when I say that, uh, as we discuss the, the shifting law after Carpenter and, and uh, um, the fact that we're here because uh, technology is is outpacing our uh, law on search and seizures. Um, and that's not the only time that uh, a, a warrantless search can occur. Um, frequently you have uh, issues of um, uh, consent. You might have a traffic, a legitimate traffic stop based on a, a, a taillight being out. And at that traffic stop, uh, an officer tries to get consent to search a vehicle and there's frequently an argument over at a later date uh, whether there was consent. Uh, an officer might say, well, I thought he was consenting. 
the driver of the vehicle said, well, I didn't mean to be consenting. I, uh, when he asked for me to hand uh, you know, over my, uh, my, my driver's license or car registration or whatever, uh, that I didn't mean for him to take that as consent. So consent is always an issue that gets uh, debated because consent is warrantless. Uh, when a, a Terry stop, that's a stop based on reasonable articulable suspicion that criminal activity is afoot. Uh, sometimes those go, if it goes beyond just a, a mere Terry stop to a pat, uh, like a pat down of a, uh, an individual because of uh, the fear that individual uh, might have uh, be concealing a weapon, those, those type of matters end up in court in evidentiary hearings. Searches incident to arrest, uh, inventory searches of seized property, a lot of those are warrantless type of searches. But we're guided by the Katz decision, which, I, which I've heard criticized today, but it does help us on certain things. The, one of them is that warrantless searches per se are unreasonable. And there has to be an existing exception before a law enforcement officer can uh, ex, uh, have a warrantless search or seizure. So I think that answers let, the question. Let me just, I just want to throw in a wrinkle to the whole warrant thing based upon some of the earlier discussion today. So, you know, law enforcement can come in and have probable cause, and they give us an affidavit to go in and search a house drug dealer. We know there's drug dealing happening in this house, and we want to, but we talked a lot today about advances in technology, right? So here's a warrant that I got recently. And I, it's not in the affidavit, so attached to the affidavit are the search protocol. This is what we're going to look at. We're going to look through these certain rooms. We're going to look through computers. We're going to look through cell phones. It said, we want you to authorize us to collect all the technology, iPads, cell phones, in the room, and whoever's there, have them put their thumb on the phones and open the phone and see. So this is, and there's no law on that. I mean, really, it's, I didn't sign it. I think m m probably most of us don't sign it, but that's a question, right? And you heard earlier some of the professors talk about the intersection between the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment. So there's a lot of open issues. Should somebody have to incriminate themselves by putting their thumb on that phone? And what are we going to do when there's facial recognition? Just hold the phone up in front of the people and see if it opens, and then you know whose phone it is. So it's a really, really interesting area. There's, there's no doubt. The, the, the challenges for all of us in the uh, courts are to come forward with reasonable methods to allow uh, law enforcement, and you know, the term reasonable is an issue, right. to allow <laughs> law enforcement to do its job, but at the same time balance it against the need to ensure that all of us as individuals are protected against uh, governmental intrusion or governmental abuse. And I want to I want to bore into that a little bit more because uh, <clears throat> uh, fundamentally, you as judges are are typically confronted with a case where either there's strong evidence that a person uh, is committing a crime, uh, or in the case of a suppression motion, there's pretty strong evidence that they have committed a crime. Um, and it can be a very serious crime. Um, and so that, that individual is not a very sympathetic individual. Uh, but Professor Gray talked about our collective interest uh, in, in security, so that that person, in effect, is representing all of us in terms of what, what police can do, what government intrusions there can be, and so forth. How do you, you talk about how you, you think about that and approach it? Do you, <laughs> yeah, do you I mean, sure. I mean, I can take a first crack at that. Look, this is a really hard thing. Um, we, <laughs> right after 9-11, right, people were, how do I put this? We were teaching new magistrate judges shortly after 9-11. And we used a vehicle, a training vehicle, that was an affidavit that said, this person is from the Middle East, and they're a student, and they live in an apartment, and they bought fertilizer from a hardware store, and they don't have a garden. And we want to search their house, because we think they're a terrorist and they're making bombs, because everybody knows that you use fertilizer and bombs, right? Well, the atmosphere in the country then, 
was everybody was afraid. And when we used this as a training vehicle, almost every new magistrate judge said, I would sign that search warrant and I would let the law enforcement go in. And then we talked to them about <laughs> probable cause. Um, 10 years later, we used the same affidavit and nobody would sign it. So I think it was, it's almost a study in we're human. And I think if somebody comes to you with a warrant for somebody, we think this person is gonna shoot up a school. I mean, it is hard, but you have to apply those same principles of probable cause. Because even though it's a terrible crime, or, you know, I get a lot of child pornography warrants, okay? There is nothing where, I mean, it is awful, and all the judges are nodding. I mean, this is horrible stuff that we see. Those are, I mean, those people, we want to stop those people, right? But you have to remember that it does affect everybody, and if you sign it for the person you think is a terrorist or a child pornographer, it will have ramifications to everyone else. You want to add to that? The uh, probable cause has not changed, but the circumstances around it, technology have. And that's, that's the challenge that we're facing. Um, uh, it's, is it too easy to do a legitimate investigation because we have iPhones that have everything on them or have access to a cloud? And I think that's even more so when you look at Carpenter, Riley, and all those cases, they're, they're looking in part to the, the cloud uh, where not even beyond your, what you're carrying in your pocket, all that data is, is someplace else. Um, and, and how we take probable cause today, and knowing that the, its definition, and it's, it's low standard, it is a low standard, but uh, uh, it's still a standard. It is you know, not, it wasn't just put into the Fourth Amendment by the founders because they liked it. They adopted it. It had a long history at the time when they adopted it and put it in the fourth uh, in, uh, in the Fourth Amendment. So uh, I mean, I don't I don't have the answer, but I do believe probable cause is the same. It's just technology is different now. Title Three wiretaps that you talked about earlier, uh, Congress made the standard for uh, a wiretap higher than the mere Fourth Amendment standard. So Congress has the capability out there of weighing what is the best standard to apply? Do we increase the probable cause standard? Do we bring in more parties to the, to the uh, uh, presentation of the package to a, a, a district judge? District judges can only issue Title III wiretaps. But in, you know, in a, a wiretap different from a regular a Rule 41 uh, warrant, um, you, you have uh, an application also by the AUSA. And that application is also supposed to uh, include a letter from the uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the United States where that, that higher level of the department is agreeing that uh, the Title uh, III application is appropriate. So Congress can address it. They can keep the probable cause standard, but they need to apply that to the changing uh, state of the law. Or um, we as judges can try to do that on a piecemeal basis. We're having to do it right now. I don't know how well we're doing. Like I said, my goal is harmless error. Uh, but, I, uh, it, but sincerely, we all want to, we're not trying to make law. We're trying to follow the law. But right now, because we aren't getting the guidance we needed, I think we're making law. Yeah, and I want to I come to that. Uh, let me just say, uh, judges Whitney and Lenahan have, have agreed to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so in a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll throw it open uh, so you can, you can think about your questions. The only caveat is short questions. Uh, but before we do that, let's come back to this technology point because um, you know, much of what you do is, is uh, not always simple, but basically straightforward application of precedent and, right. and deciding what the law is and then applying it to the facts in the case. But as, as the preceding panels have indicated, with technology, it's such a fast-moving area that the, the legal doctrine hasn't always kept up. So, and I know Judge Lenahan had at least one case that, that she really that had, to, had to deal with that. So can you talk about how you have approached some of these uh, cutting-edge questions? Sure, and, and I mean, just to, again, give the non-lawyers a, a real vision for what's happening here, the earlier panelists talked a lot about subpoenas, 
And so that's a way that the government can get information, private information, without a warrant. But there are other ways. So like starting back you know, from when you had the, the earlier telephone systems and you uh, read about this where you called the operator and you gave them the number that you were calling. So that kind of started this idea that phone numbers are really not that private. And so Congress did pass a law uh, that says that you're allowed, the government can give me a piece of paper that says, Judge, we want to get all of the phone numbers that are being called from uh, Mr. Whitney's cell phone and all the numbers that are coming into his cell phone. And the reason is that we think that we'll get information that is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. That's it. Nothing else, no affidavit, no probable cause. Okay, so you might say, well, all right, that's not a big deal. You know, the numbers that I call, I'm not too worried about. The next level, though, on the pyramid that I talked about earlier, is this thing that's called the Secured Communications Act, which goes back to this third party doctrine that has been talked about uh, all morning. Um, and basically, it's again a statute that allows the government to obtain information that is stored by a third party. Now there's a requirement, no probable cause, but the lawyer now has to say, give us specific and articulable facts showing reasonable grounds to believe that the requested information is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. Specific and articulable facts, so they throw in a couple things, probably not enough for probable cause, and we think that if we get this information, it's gonna help us in an ongoing investigation. So what is this used for? <clears throat> Let me ask you this, does anybody here think that the government can read your emails and no one has to tell you about it? Anybody? Yeah, right, absolutely. Without a doubt, okay, they can do that. Um, so they can use it to read your emails. They can use it for this um, CSLI that Professor Gray was talking about, cell site location information, which now has been decided by Carpenter, but let me just tell you a story about a case that I had, um, which was just like Carpenter, really. It was 10 years ago, so it was 2009, and the government said, we are investigating John Doe, and we think Mr. Doe is a drug dealer. And we have facts to show that he's a drug dealer, and we think that if you let us look at his historical cell tower location information for the last 45 days, now not the next 45 days, because that would be even different. The last 45 days, Judge. So we're not tracking him in real time. We just want to know where he's been for the last 45 days, every day. And we don't need a warrant for that. We want you to sign this order and order AT&T, whoever the cell carrier company was, to, to give us this information. And I said, eh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I think that sounds like tracking to me. And if you track somebody, you need a warrant. So I want you to give me a warrant. And the government said, nope, we're not gonna do that. So they made to me three arguments. And I think it's interesting because, you know, you might think 10 years ago is a long time, but it really isn't a long time at all. They said, first of all, this person is voluntarily giving their location information to the phone company because they're tracking, they're carrying a cell phone. And so they have no expectation of privacy. So they should just not carry a cell phone. Right, you're laughing. Now 10 years ago, okay, I thought that was a ridiculous argument. It had a little bit more credibility today. If you, I mean, you, I don't even think they would make that argument, but that was number one argument. Second argument was, and anyway, they have no expectation of privacy because everybody knows you can be tracked by your cell phone. Well, again, now, I think we all probably know this, but 10 years ago, I didn't know it. It was news to me. So I thought, well, you know, it's like a reasonable woman standard. I'm reasonable and I didn't know it, so I don't think it's reasonable. Um, and then the third argument at the time was, well, it's not that accurate anyway because all we're doing is triangulating from cell towers, 
And, you know, like one of the things that I said was, well, hey, maybe Mr. Doe every Monday goes to his neighbor's house after her husband leaves for work in the morning. I mean, this is an invasion of his privacy. Maybe Mr. Doe every Tuesday night goes to a location where there's an AA meeting. This is an invasion of privacy. And they said, well, no, you know, it's really not that accurate. But my point is that now it is that accurate, right? And so I wrote a very long and boring opinion where I said, no, I'm not going to allow this because you really should get probable cause and honestly, it's not that hard. It is not that hard to get probable cause. But they were trying to make a point, OK? Um, and so I wrote this opinion, and I said, no, I'm going to deny this. Um, the circuit court overruled me. They reversed me and said, no, it's OK. And in their defense, the reason they did that is because there was a congressional act. And the act said, if you give information up to a third party, the government can obtain it, and they don't need probable cause. And so to the point that's been made over and over again today and that Judge Whitney just made, Congress is not keeping up with technology. These acts that I'm talking about were passed in the 80s and the 90s. There has been nothing since then. So technology is developing at such a rapid pace that in a year from now, there will be more capabilities. I mean, we, I talked about facial recognition. There's cameras. There's so much out there. Congress isn't keeping up with it. And it sort of falls to us as a court. And I'm not supposed to be making law. OK, that's not my job. But we have to make decisions. It's like, do, you put, do I make you put your finger, your thumb on the cell phone if I'm searching your house? I mean, these are decisions that we have to make. And, and that's sort of the world that we're in right now. And, and you know, the other thing I just want to say is, if you think about it, when I made that decision was in, in 2009. So Carpenter just came out, right? Carpenter basically said, yeah, Lenahan, you were right. I know they were thinking of me when they made that decision. But in the interim, the last 10 years and even before that, this has been going on without a probable cause warrant. So it's been multiple, multiple years that this has been happening until the Supreme Court finally sort of caught up with it. Judge Whitney, you want to add anything to that? Well, just follow up on what you were saying about um, kind of pen registers and trap and traces and, and following phone calls, whether they're coming in, incoming or outgoing. That all kind of found its origin in the third party doctrine back in 79 in mm -hmm. Smith v. Maryland. And that third party doctrine, that if you turn something over to a third party, you don't have any expectation of privacy. Uh, as to what you've turned over to that third party, that's the underpinning for lots and lots of investigative techniques, uh, pen registers and trap and trace, but also subpoenas. Um, we all heard of the grand jury subpoena, but there's 300 different subpoena authorities of the US government. But they're based primarily, most of them on this third party doctrine. You can go and use a, um, a healthcare uh, a subpoena. There's a federal health care subpoena and, and serve it on a, a um, hospital and subject to uh, privacy rights, your medical record privacy rights, uh, a lot of your medical records can be turned over. Uh, there, are also, there are many other administrative subpoenas, but they're all kind of based on you can go, you go to a bank and subpoena a target's criminal, uh, excuse me, their financial records, all these different things you can do based on the fact that um, there is a third party doctrine. Now, with that said, Carpenter was kind of weakening the third party mm -hmm. doctrine. I don't, I'm not the scholar. The, the circuit judges and my colleagues are the scholars and our incredible professors before us. But Carpenter at least shows there's a conscious effort by the court to look and see is, is the third party doctrine wide open or do there need to be limits because of our ability? with technology today to store massive amounts of information and to have it very easily easily collected uh, and so you know, there's your your life is now recorded and it was 20 years ago it wasn't recorded like it is today well you know and another thing that people may not be aware of are secrecy orders so whenever the government comes to me and they say we want to look at somebody's emails um, we also want you to sign a secrecy order, which basically says, hey, Microsoft, you need to provide the emails of this person 
to the government and you are not allowed to tell the person that you have provided these emails. Why? Because it could impact an ongoing investigation. And that, again, is by statute. So if the government says, if we tell the person that we're reading his emails, it will impact our ongoing investigation. And so I sign these orders as a matter of course, because that's what I'm directed to do by Congress, uh, so that you know people just don't know. Um, I was reading a case that Microsoft has instituted a, a federal lawsuit in Seattle to say to the courts, hey, we don't like this. We don't like the fact that we're giving out our customers information and we're not allowed to tell them. We don't think this is constitutional. We want you to change it. And in an earlier, it still hasn't been decided, so that's kind of floating. But in a 2016 decision, the court noted that in the 18 months preceding its opinion alone, federal courts issued 2,600 secrecy orders just to Microsoft. So, I mean, the, the, just the volume of this is, is mind-boggling. We have a few minutes. Are there questions from the, from the audience? Uh, just before you do the questions, uh, just put your hand you got up. It. We have a microphone, right. so. We have one, oh, row. we have one down in the front. Uh, you just wait, if you'll just wait a minute, ma'am, he's gonna bring a microphone so everybody <laughs> can hear your question. Do you ever get a request to expedite these? In other words, someone calls you and you give approval over the phone that they'll provide paperwork later? Absolutely not. I have never done that. But, but it's, it's, I've never done it, but it's authorized. It is. Yeah. But, it, but it's still it's a it. sworn affidavit. I would bet that might happen on a state court level. I don't know. You were state court judge, right, Judge Chapel? Did you ever get those? No. Yeah, I don't think it's not like on TV. <laughs> And you know, it's pretty quick. I mean, they could do a warrant. They could type it up. They could show up at my house at two in the morning if they need it. And it does happen. And I, so I, we right. can do I, that. That's what happens more often. It's a, it's, the agents can get to the uh, judge's house pretty quickly. Je just as, it's a good as question, quick, though. Yeah, almost as quick as making a phone call. But it does happen in states that are larger where the judges are further apart. Absolutely. Not necessarily for time expediency, but for practical. Well, you could swear an affiant over the phone, but, but the point is, I want to look at the paper. I need to see the affidavit. It's not, I'll get you the information later. I need this right now. It, you would have the information in I mean, front of you. We do want to encourage agents to do the right thing. The right thing is, if you can get a warrant, get it. Uh, and that's why we have a Leon exception. Uh, that's why we have particularity in, in the Fourth Amendment is for agents to, to add that little bit of extra effort to, to make it over the line and then they're operating with a warrant and great. I mean, that's what the founders wanted. Other question? Yes, right here. So today I've done two things I did not do in law school. Sit in front and now ask a question. Um, <laughs> but, I, I was just like you. All right. <laughs> I never was up on a panel. <laughs> but you said something that, that really made me think, and so I'm a magistrate judge and one of the challenges that I think we're gonna be seeing more and more on the concept of probable cause is the source of probable cause. Mm -hmm. So the standard's not changed. So my question to you is, if probable cause, if I told you that probable cause is based upon an algorithm, and the algorithm says that 60% means that child pornography is going to exist at a specific location, does that change your view? <laughs> We're almost out of time. <laughs> okay, no. I'll stare up at the ceiling. No, it wouldn't change my view. Yeah. I, so, I, and I think, I think that we struggle can. with it because yeah. it's machine learning. But it's a good point. But I, then, I don't think it would change my view. No. It's a really good point because it's coming. Right. Yeah. It is definitely coming. And it's a, it's a, it's a very good point. I mean, and just to, to kind of play off that a, mi a minute, unless there are other questions, I don't want to preclude that. You know, for example, what about, you know, you have, I don't know if you've heard of this, we talk a lot about this in our conferences, the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, anything you have that's connected to the Internet, your TV is connected to the Internet if you have a smart TV. Alexa, your car, that OnStar thing. So let's say I get a warrant where OnStar is giving information that is being used as the basis for the warrant application. I mean, that's just another issue. 
had, did that person agree to let OnStar give me this information? Like OnStar says he was at the site of the bank robbery that happened, and so that's part of my probable cause, right? Am I allowed to even consider that because is that an invasion of privacy? I mean, there's just so much to this, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Well, it's also going to be an issue with facial recognition, uh, which is based on artificial intelligence, and, and there's also issues of built-in bias and things right. like that. It's not and, always accurate. Uh, right. So, you know, and you're going to be asked to issue a warrant based on a, a facial recognition technology, and there's a, a, a lot of underlying questions to that. Any one last? Yes, sir. One, one last question. You get the last question, sir. Earlier, they had made uh, comments about the, the use of data if uh, your warrant is issued for a particular cause, a crime of, uh, of some sort, but uh, you discover all sorts of other things in there. Mm -hmm. Does that still make the, the warrant uh, value, uh, particularly in, on, in regards to third party searches? Well, you know, I mean, if they're ser searching you know, for you know, you know, cell phone lo lo locations, but they discovered you know, something else. But really, really good question, right? Because this can happen. Let's say, Judge, you know what? We think that this person is a drug dealer and we want to look at their emails. And so I sign a warrant that Microsoft turns over all the emails. Well, guess what? They're also tra trafficking in child pornography. And now, it, you know, it's a whole new issue. Um, I think, you know, technically, a good agent, if this happens in a house, and they go in and they're searching a computer and they're looking for drug evidence and they see child porn, they will stop the search, come back with a new affidavit and get new coverage because they don't want to be in front of Judge Whitney on a suppression motion. But I'm not so sure that always happens. No, I agree. I don't think it happens enough. Um, but, I mean, it, 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 plain view, who said that? Plain view, doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so if, if you have the lawful authority to enter the house and to go into whatever room you go into and you get in there and, and you see a stack of photographs over on a desk and you walk over and it turns out to be child porn, right, that's in plain view and you're authorized to be there. So I don't think it's... But what if it's on the computer? Are you allowed to look through right. all the files? That, you know, I, And that's where you get containers. <laughs> you have to go into each container. You have to make sure you have the proper authority to, to do it's that. It's a good question yeah. and I think it comes up a lot. It's yeah. a complicated situation. A question that raises even more questions that we can't answer right now. <laughs> uh, we're at the end of our time. I, I thank uh, Judge Whitney and Judge Linehan for their thoughtful <laughs> remarks. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for, for being here. It's been, been a great I morning. I enjoyed it. That was, that was good. Really, really enjoyed it. I gotta joke. read your opinion. <laughs> it's boring. No. John, thank you for having thank me. Thank you. That was great. That was great. I'm getting boxes.